So welcome, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we're kind of wandering in here just because we, we didn't have a formal start time for this other right. than 10 minutes after the floor, but I'm going to call it 10 minutes. So uh, that's good. Um, uh, just for folks in the room this morning, we have uh, three different guests. Um, so I thought, you know, if we kind of divide up the time, you know, roughly half an hour a piece. I'm not sure if that will that works. accommodate you. That works. Okay, that terrific. Works. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Yes. Um, I'm just going to turn it over to you and, and let you take us through, you know, Bill Co. Um, we're kind of getting to the end of our uh, kind of week introduction on um, W-E-E-K uh, -E 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 <laughs> of kind of energy industry and kind of uh, regulated entities in Vermont. Um, so today is our, our last day of that and um, an important part of it. Well, so, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah. Um, and thanks to all of you. Um, my plan is not, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of slides here, so feel free to keep them. Actually, I culled this down from a hundred and some odd page, okay. mind-numbing package to, the, to what's here, about 30-ish. Um, okay. Surprisingly hard to do. Um, but, but what I want to do today more than anything else is, and I know there's probably varying levels of knowledge on the committee about, about some of the specific issues, so I'm glad to speed it up, slow it down, go wherever folks would like. Um, but knowing how much you've been drinking from the fire hose this week on energy issues, um, I want to try to keep it fairly fairly concise and have you take away a few things about Delco, recognizing we've got the whole session to work together as, as you know, events dictate. So um, what I thought I would do, again, I'm not going to metronomically walk through the slides, but I thought I would um, try to leave you, give you a sense of what Delco is all about. Where did Delco come from? What has our history been? So that's kind of the context setting. Give you a sense of who we are today. What do we stand for? And, and actually, it's in my, in my, I've, I've been in this industry for over 30 years. This, Velco is a very unique animal, um, and I think I think really ideally positioned to do a lot of good for the state of Vermont. And we certainly hope that we can. And we'll talk a little bit about why we are um, positioned that way. Um, talk about as I'm sure you've heard from Mary and Rebecca and others this week, um, some of the emerging issues in Vermont, some of the complex emerging issues in Vermont. Um, and what we see as Velcro's role in helping to solve some of those issues. Um, so I think if we could accomplish that today, that would be, that would be a win from my perspective. So uh, a little bit about Velco, and I, I ground and I stop at the mission, vision, and values um, for, for a really important reason. And, um, every company that I've ever been part of has a mission, vision, and values, but I'm not sure I could have told you what they were at most of the companies I was at. But at Velco, this really is our ethos. This is who we are. Um, and to summarize it very quickly, it's fundamentally to act as a trusted partner um, to help create a sustainable Vermont. And that sustainability is economic, environmental, reliability, societally. Um, and it's important, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail it's a little bit later about the way the, the kind of Velco finance works, but it's really important um, as we think about this trusted partner to help create a sustainable Vermont um, to understand how Velco dollars flow. Uh, we are, as you probably know, owned by the distribution companies in Vermont, as well as a small piece being owned by V-Light, the Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity. Um, but every dollar we make goes back to those distribution utilities through dividends, um, and they use those dollars to, re to basically reduce rates to customers. So if you cut out the middleman, fundamentally every dollar Velco makes goes back to Vermont consumers. And so as we think about how we conduct ourselves as a business and what types of things we want to do, um, it's very easy because we have that kind of north star, if you will, on the wall every time we think about what we're going to do and how we're going to operate our business. So that's an important backdrop as we think about, again, why I believe Velco is so ideally positioned to do things that can truly benefit the state of Vermont. Um, how, how unique is, is the, the Velco model if so you look across the country? There are two, oh, okay. and I've worked for both of them. The other, the other entity that's, that's set up very much like Velco is American Transmission Company, which is based in Wisconsin. It's about four times the size of Velco. And it is very, it's, it's actually used Velco, Velco's corporate structure and founding charter as its, as its uh, genesis. It's, ATC is probably 15 or 20 years old, if that, um, whereas Velco is 60 some odd years old. Um, the, the fundamental difference there is that the, not all of the distribution companies that benefit from dividends from ATC refund them to customers, use them to, use them to reduce customer rates. Uh, but, but they're really, that's it. There's only, there are only two companies like Velco in the country. Um, just a kind of a rudimentary, just to give folks, you know, tra in the traditional sense, where do we fit in the electricity value chain, the electric system, if you will? And this is a traditional view, and we'll have we'll we'll have a couple more views of this as we go through the slides. 
Um, but in the fundamental structure is there's generation, that's where the electricity is produced. There's high voltage transmission that carries the carries electricity from the generating from the generating facilities, whether they're central station generation or in the case of Vermont, um, much, much more so emergingly renewable generation that's located all over the state, um, to the distribution, to distribution voltage, to our distribution owners, uh, and they distribute it to customers. So we fit squarely in the center of the value chain, if you will, and that's, that is the role that we play. Um, just some quick facts. We were founded in 1956. We currently have 148 um, employees based in mostly in Rutland, although we do have an office here in Montpelier as well. Um, we build, own, and operate all of the high voltage electric transmission in the state of Vermont, um, roughly 738 miles of high voltage transmission. Importantly for some of the work that we've already started to do with, with this committee and others is we also have 1,500 miles of fiber. Um, of cutting edge technology fiber. So twice as many miles of fiber as we have of transmission. That fiber was mostly installed to support the Velco system and the Velco assets. It gives us the ability to look into our system in real time. Uh, it also gives us the ability to have a very robust communication channel in the event of outages that, that threaten um, some of the more rural areas of Vermont. We have a radio system based on that fiber that, that uh, is very effective for us. Uh, but again, we believe that fiber can be utilized uh, to help solve some of Vermont's broadband problems. It is not the answer in and of itself, but as, as you all know, it, it certainly can play a significant role uh, in helping to connect. And in fact, we'll talk a little bit later, we've already begun to leverage the availability of that fiber to do things like to connect them to the Northern Vermont University system. Linden and, and Johnson are connected. They have a redundant connection using Vermont's Velcro fiber um, that provides them a redundant backhaul for their systems, connecting the two campuses. Uh, as I talked about, our ownership is all of the distribution companies in Vermont, uh, most notably Green Mountain Power. Um, as well as the, the Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity. The Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity, for those who may not know, was a creature of the merger between CVPS and GMP a number of years ago. Um, and that was that fund basically uh, gets an allocation of Velco's earnings every year um, and manages them and invests them in low income, ideally low income, um, whether it's weatherization, lighting, et cetera. Um, Is that a percentage? It's very small, it's like 1%. I think I have a slide here later on. I won't try to flip to it, but it's, it's, it's a very small percentage, about a percent, I believe. Uh, I think it's around a million dollars, a little over a million dollars a year that gets allocated to VLAC. Mm -hmm. um, the governance, which also changed as a result of the merger between CVPS and GMP. Pre-merger, the governance was very heavily dominated by GMP and CVPS. They had most of the board seats. Um, as part of the conditions that were put on that merger is now a much bigger board with independence, public power is represented, Green Mountain Power is represented. We'll, I have a slide in, in a couple of slides, so I won't go into the total detail, but that, that the, the, the evolution of that board was directly influenced by the merger between the two large distribution utilities. Um, as it, we are a for-profit corporation, but as I mentioned, our, our structure um, effectively means we operate like a cooperative in the sense that all of our dollars go back to consumers. And we are in our sixth year, Tom is very proud of this, we are in our sixth year of a flat budget, so we haven't increased our budget in over six years. Um, this map, which I won't dwell on, just gives you a little bit of a sense of, since 1956, some of the things that we have done down the right-hand side in that right-hand box. Um, the map on the left is the high voltage portion of our system, uh, the regional portion of our system. Uh, it gives you a sense of a number of the projects that we have done over the years. Um, and this next slide basically gives you a sense of the growth of Velco since 2000. Um, from a roughly an $84 million company to a $1.3 billion company in terms of gross rate base um, over that period of time. And not surprisingly, that growth occurred um, beginning in the late 90s and early 2000s when New England moved from an integrated structure to a market-based structure, and transmission was forced to play a very different role um, than it played historically. Um, historically, transmission was basically to connect generating stations um, to, uh, to load. Um, and after New England and, and many other regions of the country moved towards competitive markets, transmission basically became the highway across which electricity moves to, to enable those markets. Um, and so we've seen growth not only in Vermont, but elsewhere in New England as well in the transmission system. Um, so I have a question. Shoot. And it couldn't be more fundamental. Uh, your last slide, yes. and, and as well as this slide, so that kind of indifferent which, which, where you keep the um, slide up there. Um, the 738 miles yeah. of transmission line that you have, is that, is that map, a, is that a pretty good proxy for the kind of the major assets? That is a good proxy for the major, the 345 
345,000 volt lines. Okay. Um, there's and what a, portion of that of your assets is that? I mean, is that half? It's um, it's over it's over half. Okay. Um, including basically in New England, there there is a delineation between what's considered a regional asset and what's considered a local asset. Um, okay. In uh, roughly our revenue requirements are roughly 75 to 80 percent regional assets, uh, and the rest is local. Yeah. And uh, this might not at all be an appropriate analogy, but I, I, it's. it's Kind of how my mind is working, thinking about this of you know kind of the uh, you know the blood vessels of the body right. um, and kind of the major pipes, if you will, yep. going to kind of smaller and smaller pipes as they get to you know somebody flipping their light switch on. Um, is it uh, Velco owns the major pipes? We have we have the, we have the arteries and the larger veins. Yeah, um, and the distribution company operates the capillaries. I guess I would yeah. I would put it in that part. Okay, Sorry. great. Okay. And and then finally on the asset growth, um, is that uh, is that growth a function of um, added assets? Um, yes. To the, yes. So phys added physical. Physically assets. added assets, constructed lines, constructed transmission substations, et cetera. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Well, so in my That's question is on the asset growth also also very basic because I don't know anything about this. Why did it grow? Did, did your assets grow so much, and why? How is that related to um, the competitive markets for transmission? Basically, as I said, if if you think about the old model um, in Vermont, um, Vermont Yankee was built, and the transmission would connect Vermont Yankee to major load centers. So there would be, if, if we, if Vermont were a standalone state, there would be a line built into the Burlington Chittenden area, Chittenden County area, to serve the, that area, and so that the, the um, transmission played a. a a fairly rudimentary function, which was a simple one-way power delivery. Um, when when industry restructuring occurred in the late 90s, and it occurred in first in Connecticut, then in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, ultimately to some degree in Vermont, though not quite as much, and to a le even lesser degree in New Hampshire, um, the basic premise was that competitive generation would ultimately drive innovation, it would drive costs down, uh, much like a commodity, if you will, moving grain, moving grain from on a highway system from the Midwest to wherever it was going to be used. It was, if you think about electricity as a commodity. But for that commodity to move effectively, um, there needed to be policies that incented high voltage transmission to be built. Um, the, the market premise or the economic premise, which has been supported in a number of studies, is that even though there was an enormous amount of transmission built and money spent on transmission, there was a much more demonstrative reduction in electricity prices compared to what they would have been had that transmission not existed, i.e. the free flow of electricity, the ability of those electrons to move freely wherever they were ultimately used. Um, far outweighed um, the cost of the transmission that was built to serve to serve that to basically serve that purpose. So this is new transmission that was built, or is this upgraded transmission? Uh, it's a combination. There, was, yeah. there were a number of new lines built in Vermont as well as in the rest of New England, mm -hmm. um, but there were also, for example, some of some of the Velco lines were reconductors, so they could operate either at higher voltages or to or there were um, substations put in to relieve uh, you know other 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 asset infrastructure put in to relieve, for example, relieve congestion and allow mm -hmm. power to flow freely. Speaking of congestion, one thing I'm sure you've heard about Shi'i, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But fundamentally, that was the that was the premise. So it's a combination of reconducting, rebuilding, um, and building new new assets, new new infrastructure. Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, again, just a quick overview of our distribution company ownership um, structure, mostly as as you see GMP, but obviously uh, BED is a significant owner. Uh, they they have a board seat. Um, um, Vermont Electric VEC has a board seat as well, um, and those those other public entities that do not have specific seats on the board, and we'll talk about that in a minute, are represented by public power representatives on our board. I won't dwell on the corporate structure. Um, really, not a lot of critical messages to take away there. Again, this is this is a this is a um, visual of our current board structure. Again, driven to a great degree by the the, v, the CBPS GMP merger. Um, so GMP has four seats on the board. Um, VEPSA has a seat, um, VEC and BED, um, and then there are three seats for VLIGHT and two seats for public power, and those are elected annually by the representative group of public power entities that own parts of Delco. What is VLIGHT? So VLIGHT is that, that low income trust that was a creature of the, the, the GMP CBPS merger. Um, just to give a, just to give you an over, a quick overview of 
Um, the, the differences in terms of the way transmission is regulated compared to distribution. Um, transmission is considered interstate commerce versus intrastate commerce and therefore is regulated at the federal level. So from a, from a rate regulatory perspective, we are primarily regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, in Washington, D.C. Um, so they establish, they establish for all of New England and all of the transmission industry in the U.S., they establish the rates and tariffs and rates of returns and, and, and other, other items in terms of how we're regulated and how we can price what we charge our customers. Um, they also, since the blackout of 2003, that affected New England significantly um, and the Atlantic Coast significantly, um, have been very focused on reliability and, comp and compliance standards. Um, and created a, an entity called NERC, and that we'll, we'll see that in a minute. And they are, they be, NERC is a, is a creature of FERC, um, so they oversee not only the, the, um, the regulatory rate making, uh, they also oversee reliability, um, and all of the ISOs and, and RTOs in the U.S., New England ISO, New York ISO, um, are fundamentally creatures of FERC as well, so. Um, of the tra transmissions, power transmission, how much is uh, for use in state, and how much is passed through? Uh, about 20% is for use in state, and the rest is passed through. But we'll we'll talk a little bit about the way, the way New England rates work. It's actually New, Vermont is a net beneficiary of being part of the regional system from a, from a financial perspective. So I'll show those statistics in a little bit. So this is the New England, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, again, founded after the blackout of 2003, created by the U.S. government in the black, after the blackout of 2003, uh, and their, their fundamental purpose is to develop and enforce reliability standards to ensure high reliability for the electric transmission system, which, as we talked about in, those, in, a, in a market type of economy, um, the, the availability of that transmission system, both from a reliability perspective but also from a cost perspective, uh, is so critical. Um, NERC, NERC's emerging focus, not surprisingly, over the past few years has been around cyber, um, cyber attacks and, and ensuring reliability from, from what is becoming an ever more sophisticated foreign state uh, threat uh, to reliability. And we don't have to pick up the Wall Street Journal more than once a week to read about the threats coming from, the, from a cyber perspective for the, the electric system. Uh, we talked about ISO New England. I think Molly is, is here uh, in a little bit to talk about ISO New England's role. And um, we as ELCO are a member of, of the ISO New England. Um, and ISO New England basically plans the transmission system and operates the markets, both energy and capacity markets in New England. Um, and they also, um, they also are the, the primary transmission operator um, for uh, for New England. Velco is actually a local control center, so we do have the ability to, to control and operate the transmission system in Vermont as well. Um, and, have a, and have a control center in our facility in Rutland as well as a, new, a backup center that we're going to build uh, in New Haven, Vermont. Um, and then this, just, this is just a representative of kind of the, the concentric circles or, or relationships between um, Velco and the DUs and the various regulatory agencies. Um, the Vermont, the Vermont Ju uh, Public Utility Commission jurisdiction over, in terms of Velca, in terms of its purview over Velca, was fun fundamentally focused on um, siting and certificates of public good and public need. Questions before I move on? <laughs> that was pretty quick. Okay. Well, let me know if you'd like to stop somewhere and talk about. It. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get through a fair bit, knowing we have a half an hour. Yep, so yep, keep going. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm, if I can ask a question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Velco and ISO New England are two separate entities. Absolutely. Um, the, I've been to the ISO New England uh, distribution control center there. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the same one that you're talking about that Velco operates? Or is that a we, have a, we have a separate control center um, that, that looks only at Vermont. How do the two control centers operate together? They can operate together or separately depending on the event that dictates. Fundamentally, ISO New England is the primary operator of the New England transmission system, but Velco as a local control center, and that, that, that term has meaning uh, in FERC's, FERC and NERC space, in operation space, um, has primary day-to-day -day uh, responsibility for operating the system, but everything we do is seen and overseen by, by ISO New England, so they have control of the entire New England system, but we actually do most of the switching and physical operation of the, Vel of the Vermont system. Um, the uh, 1,200 plus miles fiber mm -hmm. that you operate, um, how much of, how much of the bandwidth on that fiber uh, do you use for your operations? It, and how much might be available for the purposes? It it, cha it changes over time. I am not a fiber expert, but we have fiber experts. Um, 
um, who basically tell me it's not so much the physical fiber itself, it's the equipment at either end that's allowing capacity to actually increase over time without actually changing out the fiber. Um, Mark, do you happen to know, is there a, do you have a number? Well, it depends, but um, we use somewhere around 20 to 40% of the fiber capacity for our own internal controls. Um, I think that's and right. As John was saying, I think when we first installed, it was a little tighter than that, but the electronics on either end of the fiber are where it increased the capacity. And the technology seems to be growing every year and increasing that capacity. So we are at a place, I think, where we have significant excess capacity on our fiber system. So that capacity will increase then? If the electronics increase, if we yeah. Yes. Increase, yeah. Yeah. yes, it has. And it's what it's what is is what we would refer to as middle mile fiber. It's not it's not fiber that's there for that last mile, but it's really kind of the backbone middle mile fiber um, that, that would be available um, and that we're looking for opportunities to leverage. Yes, yes sir. Um, going back to cybersecurity, and uh, so I imagine you have a pretty robust Yes. System yes. in place. Do you work with the distribution utilities? We we do. Um, we actually there's a there is a there's a group and it's referenced later in here called the operating committee and basically the operating committee is representatives from Belco and all the distribution utilities. <laughs> At the operating committee, we have effectively a subcommittee um, that focuses on cyber issues. Cyber, cyber issues are obviously much more acute on the tra at the transmission at transmission level than they are at the distribution level, mm -hmm. um, and so we are that we lead that subcommittee, um, and we are very active um, both at, from from Tom Dunn from Tom Dunn down through our ops folks are very active um, through the transmission industry and also utilizing some of the, some existing resources in the U.S. that have some very cool code names um, that are basically looking at looking at threats and running algorithms to understand how how behavior. Um, can, can influence what we see coming at us, and we share all that information with the distribution companies through this subcommittee of the operating committee. It, is it at 1,200 uh, route miles or fiber miles? Is route it, miles. I'm sorry, 12, 15, it's 15. 15, yeah, 1,500 15 route miles? That's right. Route miles, yes. thank you. Yes, yep. We have much more than that, obviously, in uh, fiber optic miles, most sure. of our systems. 72 and our places we have 144 strands. Yeah. It, 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 ser it, it serves a tremendous reliability role. For example, we had there's a there's a cable that runs uh, from from the Vermont side of Lake Champlain to the New York side of Lake Champlain called the PB20 line. Um, it's it's a co-owned asset between New York Power Authority and Velco. Um, tragically, uh, a couple of months ago there was a helicopter impact on the New York side. Um, they were actually stringing fiber on the New York side um, and a helicopter caught the line um, and we, because of the equipment, the fiber that we have on our system, that, that, that fault was recognized and the system was re-switched re in less than four electric cycles, which is phenomenal. Um, and that's the value of having that fiber on. What's one of the values of having that fiber on the system? Just to clarify, and in, in case anybody doesn't know, a route mile could be, if you've got a mile of fiber with a six strand, that's six fiber miles, but one route mile. Right. That's so, right. So uh, when folks say they've got a, you know, hundred thousand fiber miles, that doesn't necessarily mean anything until you know how many route miles. Could be hundred thousand cables for hundred thousand fibers for one mile. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Good. No. Good point. Very good point. Um, a little bit about Velco Finance, and again, because we're we're not we're not uh, blessed with too much time, I won't go into too much detail. So the the. The first slide is really the key, the key thing I want you to take away. Beyond, beyond what I talked about earlier on when I talked about the mission, vision, and values, which is all the dollars that we as Velcro earn go back to Vermont consumers on a one-for-one -one basis. Um, the second is, is the importance of being part of the New England system um, and the value to Vermont of being part of the New England system. Um, all of the transmission companies in New England, National Grid, Eversource, Central Maine, Velco, um, base it for, for the assets that are considered regional assets, those assets that serve a regional reliability or economic purpose, um, the revenue requirements for those assets are built across the region. Um, they're, they're aggregated by ISO New England, ISO New England bills those to, to the distribution companies, to the load serving entities across New England. Um, that billing is done based on each state's peak load, each utility's peak load, um, as a percentage of the overall New England peak load. New Vermont is 4% of New England's peak load, so we pay 4% of the cost of the regional transmission facilities in the state of Vermont. Um, our revenue requirement, the amount of costs that are from Velco that are billed to New England, um, makes up 7% of New England ISO's total costs. So under, in, 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 under current state, 
um, we are actually Vermont is a net beneficiary by being by being a member of New England ISO. I.e., we 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 ship more costs out than we bring costs in. Um, and I'll talk about that. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a sense of the dollars associated with that in just a second. This this just gives you a sense of the overall. Um, cost for Velco, the overall revenue requirement, and revenue requirement in utility terms, for those who don't know, many probably don't very well, um, is basically your return on and of investment, so your depreciation of an investment over its life, uh, the carrying cost of that investment, both debt and equity, and then your operating costs, including taxes and salaries and everything else from the cost to operate a company. So the revenue requirements for Velco are paid, are 80% are allocated to the region, uh, so that's the percentage of our assets fundamentally that are, that are regional uh, assets and 20% remains in Vermont. And so what that looks like from a from Vermont's perspective, and this title of this slide is a little bit deceiving, but um, Vermont consumers pay roughly $88.5 million of the regional costs, of cost of the regional transmission system. They pay $41 million of costs cost associated with the local Vermont system, i.e. costs that can't be allocated across the region. But Velco, as an entity, earns $93.9 million. That all goes back to Vermont consumers. So the net cost of transmission, and this is in 2019, based on 2019 budget, the net cost of transmission to Vermont consumers is $35.7 million. So again, a net beneficiary by being part of Vermont, the, the regional, um, the regional uh, part of the New England ISO. And I don't know that we'll get to it, but another, we do have a slide later on, which you're, you're obviously free to peruse as you, as you see fit. Um, which shows that Vermont has traditionally been an importer, a net importer of power. Uh, that became much more acute after the closure of Vermont Yankee. And so we are, we right now import power 100% import power of the time. We are a net importer of power. So the physical reliance on that regional system um, is, is real as well. So what are we seeing, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about this as the week has gone on, um, what are we seeing in terms of the issues that, are, that are, we're facing as a state and as a region um, as we look at the next, we're, as we look at what's going on right now, um, and even more so as we look at the, at the next several years. Um, obviously, continued penetration of renewable resources um, in New England, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I, or in Vermont rather, um, obviously, that's that's affecting the Shiite region. Have folks seen the PUC decision from yesterday? Um, okay, the PUC yesterday denied the Derby Solar application for which was in the Shiite region, um, and uh, so I would encourage you to read that. Uh, that that yeah, I'm, I'm I, ha I haven't had a chance to fully synthesize it, but but fundamentally they they based, they denied it on the premise that it makes the constraint issues in Shiite more acute, uh, more significant. Um, so that's obviously, and there are a number of proposed projects. Nextera has two 20, me 20 megawatt projects proposed up there, and there are a number of other projects proposed in the Shiite. So that's obviously an issue that we need to address and figure out how to solve. Um, and we're seeing in Vermont a, a lot of the solar generation from our perspective that is more distributed, i.e. behind the meter, it's either on rooftops or it's, it's fairly small scale. There is a tremendous amount of it that we're around. We're around 300 megawatts in total um, solar, just over 300 megawatts in total solar capacity in, in Vermont. Um, some expectation we may climb as high as 1,000 um, over the next few years. A lot of that solar for us as Velco is invisible to us. We can't see it because it's behind the meter, and so we, and we don't know how it's operating. We don't know whether those solar panels um, are, have snow on them or not, um, whether they have icing on them or not. So our ability to see the resources and thus balance the system and operate as that local control center is getting more and more complex. Um, it's not a problem, it's a challenge, um, and we're actually doing very well at the, the, our operating folks are doing very well at dealing with it, but it's going to be an increasing challenge for us. Um, and again, as storage begins to develop, that's another, that's another distributed asset that will cr create an ever more dynamic system for us to, con to be able to operate in balance. Um, an issue that's not a Vermont issue, but it, but it, but it has Vermont tentacles to it, um, is the, the increasing reliance, and you'll probably hear from this from Molly, I don't know. Um, a little bit later, but um, when, she sh when she comes, but is um, the dependence of New England from a generation perspective on natural gas. As a lot of the older coal and, and oil-fired plants have retired, and some of the nuclear units have retired, um, the, the, the portfolio of New England generation has, has gravitated towards natural gas. I think it's 50 plus percent of New England generation is now natural gas fired, um, which during normal operating conditions is, is fine. Um, from, a, from a physical perspective, but there's been no new additional gas capacity into New England in a, in a number of years. 
Um, and get ge generators don't sign up for firm gas. They don't have the ability to recover that cost through, their, through, the, through the markets. So they sign up for interruptible gas. So they are the first customer to be interrupted on a cold peak day. Um, and we just actually saw gas customers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island getting cut off this week uh, because there wasn't sufficient gas supply across the Algonquin pipeline into New England. So what ended up happening on a very cold day in the, in the um, polar vortex winter of 23, 20, 2013, 2014, um, some of the estimates are that because of the unavailability of gas into the region, New England consumers paid between three and four billion dollars more for electricity than they would have if there was ample gas supply in New England. So we have, n we have no increase in gas supply. We have increasing gas uh, generation in our generation portfolio. And there are obvious impacts to Vermont. One is cost. Um, so the cost comes in two different ways. One is cost, the simple cost of that, those peak day, that peak day power um, when the gas isn't available for those units to run. Uh, and the second is ISO is wrestling with resource adequacy, and you'll definitely hear about this from the ISO folks, and what we call fuel security. Uh, and that is some of these plants that announce that they want to retire, oil plants, um, or even some of the gas plants they want to retire, simply can't be allowed to retire because they're too important to the system from a reliability perspective. And so they're fundamentally given cost of service contracts, which are expensive, and Vermont consumers pay a portion of those costs. And so from Vermont's perspective, I think, as we as, we as Velco think about our, our advocacy at New England ISO, uh, a lot of it is around fuel security. We also get very concerned uh, we actually did a we did a uh, emergency response uh, exercise at Velco, where we looked at what would happen if we were in a scenario where we had an extended cold snap, two, you know, one to two weeks, ten to ten to fourteen day cold snap, where a lot of the, where the gas fundamentally became unavailable to those generating units, the units that run on oil uh, and other fuels where there's on, where there's limited on site inventory actually are unavailable, unable to run, and you might lose a you might lose a major transmission line. The Hydro Quebec power doesn't flow typically well in the winter; it either stays in Quebec or it's frozen, um, so that that's not a huge resource in the winter. Um, as it is in the summer, um, and it's, it could be reasonably dire um, if we don't address fuel security, and that's a, that's a huge issue that ISO is wrestling with. And again, I'm sure you'll hear a lot more, and they're much more adept at that issue than I am. Um, again, I don't know how we're doing for time, Mr. Chairman, but we're... Uh, we have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier that the, the second column on this, on this uh, in the box shows uh, 2014. Um, we had 625 megawatts of nuclear power available to us. Um, that's now gone. Um, and so we, we've gone from, in 2014, importing, we exported power 73% of the time. We now import power 100% of the time. Um, and that, that, given the scale of the generation shut, shutdown, the uh, Vermont Yankees shutdown, um, is likely to persist for the foreseeable future. So we will be a net importer uh, of power. Well, when you say that uh, Vermont exported power 73% um, of the time, and um, that was because of the Vermont Yankees, uh, importing power 100% of the time, that, that just means that at any given time, energy is flowing into Vermont. We have less generation right. available than the, load. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, a lot of the electricity being consumed, though, is generated in Vermont. Correct. Correct. There is a there is a difference between the physical delivery and the and the contractual delivery of power. That is correct. That is correct. So a lot of the a lot of the um, a lot of the the larger renewable projects that are proposed in Vermont are being proposed um, under contracts that are bid into either Connecticut or Massachusetts RFPs. So those those are contractually committed to those states. But the physical flow of electricity follows physics. Um, so that that power is not necessarily physically delivered to those states. Yes. No. I just want to make sure I understand uh, the solar uh, line, which is uh, we are sending much more solar. Uh, maybe I don't. It's Ex exporting much more solar than we are using. Is that right? No, it's that's that's just an approximate. I. I just I just had to expand it for my so my thing. aging eyes. No, so, so we had about a, we had 100 roughly 100 megawatts of solar in 2014, and we have 325 now and growing. Please don't go far. Might, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank God, I thank for Apple technology. I can actually expand that and see it. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of the the, the sources of Vermont's energy on a peak day. Uh, in the, on the left in the in the winter, um, and on the right in the summer, and so it shows you that fundamentally those ties. Um, i.e. imports of power are by far the largest source of our power. 
um, and then the other pieces of you know, some wind, hydro, solar, biomass, and methane um, are other sources of in-state power for us. Those are the basically the transmission ties. So the ties from New York and the rest of New England that import that allow us to import power. So the takeaway, so yeah. Real quick question on the previous yeah. slide. So in the summer, uh, you show zero solar. Is that because it's invisible to you? On the yes. Right hand slide. Yes. It's during the. This is the peak. Peak it's hour. Peak, which is in the which is at night. Is, in, is that night? So here, so the so okay. I, I took out oh, as I, I called a number of slides. Um, but one of the one of the things that's happening, we're talking about the kind of the system operational challenges of the solar, is that typically, and not surprisingly, if you just on a hot summer day, you would expect the peak to be around 4 or 5 o'clock, 2, 3, 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Right. The industry is still running. People are coming home, turning on air conditioners. You would expect that would be the peak. You would see the peak demand on the system. For us, actually, that's when, that's when the curve slides down because all of that solar is available. And so the demand on this, which is all behind the meter, so the demand on the system um, is actually down. Once the sun sets, that comes snapping back up. And so what we've seen over the past few years is our peak in Vermont has been around 8 or, eight or 9 o'clock at night in the summer so when none of, that, none of that solar be, is available. Peak consumption may be mid-afternoon, but peak transmission. Peak transmission is demand is, is, after is, is capacity is after dark. That's correct. Got it. That's correct. So the, the, the net takeaway, which I'm sure you've been hearing from others all week long, and you'll hear from ISO, uh, is that the grid operation is becoming ever more complex. Um, and, and those are challenges that, that we believe we, as Velcro, can, can play a helpful role in helping to solve and are playing a helpful role in helping to solve. Um, integrating more renewables in a thoughtful way, um, contemplating whether storage um, can be deployed um, alongside of a number of those renewable resources to provide a more firm product um, and help relieve some of the constraints. I think it's something that we, we are looking at very closely um, and working with a number of folks around the industry. If you look at, uh, if you look at the way uh, the recent Connecticut RFP uh, and a number of the RFPs for renewable energy around the rest of the country, um, they're no longer going out simply seeking renewable energy. They're going out seeking renewable energy partnered with storage so that the product is a firm, deliverable product all the time. Um, and I think from a Vermont's perspective, that's the implementation of storage. Um, where economically and reliability-wise feasible um, is something that we are looking very closely at. Um, and obviously continuing to work with New England ISO um, on, the, on the fuel security issues. I think I'm down to about <coughs> one minute. Um, so I guess what I would, what I would this, is the, this, is, this is the Sheffield Highgate inter Export Interface. Um, what you've heard, around, heard about is SHEI. Um, and fundamentally, obviously, it's a part of the system in Vermont where there's very little load. Uh, the demographics are fairly are fairly sparse uh, in that part of the state. Um, the the Hydro Quebec uh, fate lines comes through the Highgate Highgate uh, uh, converter, um, and there's a there's a significant amount of renewable generation in that area that's looking to get out, especially at, at peak times of the day when renewable generation is running, um, and it is currently constrained. Um, and so, along with the distribution companies, we are actively looking at aggressively and actively looking at solutions to help help Shi help solve Shi, but also you may have heard this week from others about to help Shi to keep Shi from sliding south from growing, um, and making sure that that part of the, the part, that part that constrained part of the state doesn't become bigger and more acute. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, from the perspective again, I think it's a combination of finding the, finding additional load, mm -hmm. additional demand. <laughs> Um, maybe some transmission upgrades, probably not new build, but potentially upgrading some existing lines um, as cost effectiveness uh, dictates, uh, storage, uh, and again, thoughtful, thoughtful siting and, and development of renewable resources in the GI is, is, are all probably part of the answer. And then just to kind of reground on the strategic initiative, or on the mission, vision, and values, uh, I talked a little bit about the work that we did to interconnect the, the Vermont State Colleges, the Northern, the J Linden and Johnson campuses. Um, and we are looking at other ways um, to leverage our existing personnel and our existing resources and assets and capabilities um, to generate additional revenues, which again, all flows back to Vermont consumers. Um, so the revenue that we earn from that Vermont State College um, contract goes back, to, goes back to our owners and ultimately goes back to Vermont consumers. And so we are actively looking to do things um, outside of our immediate core business, adjacent to that core business. Uh, that can uh, that can add additional value to the state of Vermont, and with that, I would I would close. That was a great presentation, <laughs> and I can find you. <laughs> I feel like this FedEx man. And, and you yeah. fended off questions <laughs> very well too. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, we're having a hearing next week on Shiite uh, to dig a little more deeply into that. Um, it's definitely something that's come up a number yes. of times yes. this week. And um, we may be inviting you back to happy to happy to, to, happy to, to come back. That again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, happy to do happy to do so and, and bring a bring a real technical expert if you would like who, yeah. who has a really good understanding of the, the issues in Shiite. Great. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Monday or Tuesday? Yeah. Excuse me, Tuesday or Wednesday. You still don't know which week. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very quick uh, question on net metering. Um, is net metering in front of or behind the meter? Uh, um, let's talk about it in a minute. But okay. Here, um, it's, it's net. Literally, it's net. So when your energy consumption is shown to the real world. So the production is behind the meter, but yes. some of it flows through the roof. That's right. OK. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> what about community solar? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> community solar field. You're getting out of my job. As, as, as a net meter, um, I, I understand your question, but I'm not sure if it would be better if it's already solar. If community solar isn't consuming at all, it's just producing, then it wouldn't be a net. No, but I mean, it's connected, it's connected to the grid, like on the grid side of the meter, not on the right. Right? So, so it's not behind the meter in that case. Right. So, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, 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 saying you've got two Hello, how are you? No, one. One. Okay. I'm here. Tell me the name. Plug it in. I think I tried getting one. Do you have a laser? I do, but you just shined it in somebody's face. I did. I'm so sorry. I didn't even know it was on yet. <laughs> Thank you. I saw a green dot yeah, building. Did anybody go for them? I don't think it was their eye. Okay. So, so it's not yours. Yeah. It's not yours. Seth. Ah, my brother Seth. In some countries we'd be married now. Massachusetts. We get along most days. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Um, you're Edward? Eric. Eric. Yes. Eric. You're not Molly. No, okay. no, no. Those are I'm, bigger shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Tim Briglin, uh, the chair of the committee, and um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'm happy that we have you kind of on, on the heels of Velcro. I think this, this actually does dovetail quite well in terms of our um, committee's understanding. So uh, I'm going to let you guys uh, run with it. We have um, we have until about 11:30. Okay. Um, just to give you a sense of. Um, Okay, sounds great. Uh, for the record, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm the Director of External Affairs at ISO New England. Uh, we are located just down 91 in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, with me today is my colleague, Molly. Good morning, Molly Connors, ISO New England. Great, and uh, we are also represented here in uh, Montpelier by John Holler, who I think you know. So as a follow-up, if there's anything I can do, Molly can do from uh, the ISO's perspective for John, please feel free to use us as a resource. And uh, so, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, thank you for having us down. Uh, we put together a presentation which gives you kind of a broad look at the organization, some of the resources that are tied into the system, how that mix is changing, and uh, we'd be happy to take questions along the way. We'd also love to have you come down and see the control center in Holyoke at a first-hand view of the operations. I'm and very eager to do that. Yes. Mike was saying he'd, he'd been to it. But, yeah. uh, so uh, let, let, let's make that happen if we great. can, and we'll yeah. happy to accommodate you. Uh, Molly also brought a map of the, uh, the power system just as a resource for you. This is public information. It's on our website, but uh, maybe a point of reference if you're looking at the transmission system in the future from the grid perspective. Um, so I think I'm going to scroll here. Yep. We'll talk about the organization itself. Uh, the grid at a glance. Uh, we'll talk about some of the strategic planning issues that we've dealt with. I'm not sure how much of that has come up in the conversation, but we can discuss that, spend some time talking about resources on the grid and how the transmission system uh, is evolving. So our organization um, celebrated its 20th anniversary in uh, uh, 
after the formation in 1997. So we came about at the same time that Congress was opening up the competitive wholesale markets to new power generators uh, across the country. And um, many of the New England states were opening up retail access for competition. So the ISO was formed to oversee the competitive wholesale markets in New England. I understand, obviously, Vermont's in a different place, not having gone down that path, but still are part of a, a regional transmission system in a wholesale market. Uh, we are the reliability coordinator for uh, most of the New England region. Uh, the one exception to that is the northern part of Maine, which is really not connected to the New England grid. It's actually connected to the system in New Brunswick. But we uh, take care of reliability coordination for essentially the six states in the region. And unlike all of the companies that own transmission, own power plants, maybe taking financial interest uh, positions in the market, we are independent of all of those market participants. We have a code of conduct that we abide by as employees. Um, our senior team abides by that, and we have an independent board of directors also. So when Molly and I joined the organization, we don't own any stock or financial interest in uh, Velco or CLMP or in any of those companies that are participating in the market. We're also neutral when it comes to technology. So sometimes that works out the way people like, and sometimes people want us to be more of an advocate for certain resources, whether it's uh, a renewable technology, gas technology, hydropower, or uh, nuclear power. We say we administer the wholesale markets, and we select the least cost resources. We don't pick which technologies uh, should be developed in the region. So you're agnostic except for cost and reliability? Yeah, it's really reliability is the primary uh, objective, and uh, the costs really reflect the, the physical constraints or resources that are operating in the system. So if you step back from uh, sort of the governance of the organization and think about our three major roles, it's grid operations. In that area, you can imagine that we are like the air traffic controller for the bulk power system. Uh, air traffic control is making sure that planes take off and land safely. Our job is to make sure that we balance supply and demand instantaneously 24-7 uh, uh, every day of the year for the New England power system. And we're operating the high voltage transmission network. And uh, this is unlike the poles and wires you would see moving down uh, local streets and local communities. If there's a local outage, somebody hits a pole and the power goes down in the community, that's not going to register in the transmission system that we operate. So we're looking at the lines that typically you would see crossing the highways, uh, usually on the larger wood or uh, steel lattice structures. Um, so that's the grid operation. Uh, the market administration function, we uh, administer the wholesale market platform for the region, bring together buyers and sellers. Um, the buyers are typically the load serving entities. In some cases, that's utilities. In some cases, cases it's a competitive supplier. And uh, the sellers would be people who own power plants in the region who want to sell that, or people who have contracts with generator owners, or even contracts outside of the region, and they use the transmission system to import that power. So we administer that market, and it's a little bit like the um, New York Stock Exchange. Right? We're not buying and selling directly. We provide that platform for buyers and sellers to do that. And a couple questions. Um, that was my question. I think you just answered. You don't own any transmission facility. That's correct. Do you own? Uh, infrastructure other than the headquarters in Holyoke? No. Well, yes, we own uh, headquarters in Holyoke, and then we have a backup facility in Connecticut, which we use for business continuity planning purposes. Competitive supplier? Yeah, so in, um, in my state, I have the option to take my power supply as a retail customer from Eversource, and they would buy that power on my behalf, or I could choose a competitive supplier who's licensed by the Public Utility Commission in Connecticut to sell to retail customers. And every state except Vermont, for Vermont has some form of retail competition, so those customers can do that. It's and, why yep. I didn't know. Yep, no, that's fine. That's okay. um, and then uh, power system planning, we have responsibility to look five to 10 years into the future, look at what the demand for power is expected to be, look at the resources that we have available, look at the resources that are committed to coming online through our market, and we make sure that the transmission system can serve that anticipated demand and that we have enough resources to do it. We do that really in two ways. We, we plan the transmission network, and if there's upgrades that are needed, we work with uh, the utility companies to make sure that we have a reliable system in the future. 
and then we run the uh, Ford capacity auction to make sure that we have enough resources moving on those wires um, to serve the demand. Uh, a really busy diagram, it might be uh, tough to see on the screen, but anybody who's highlighted in red is an entity that oversees the work that we do as an organization. So we're kind of in the middle. Sometimes people will say, well, the ISO is responsible for a lot of things. We are, but we report to, as I mentioned, independent board of directors. Uh, our board's profiles and um, information are posted on our website so people can see who they are. Uh, ultimately, we report to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, FERC delegated responsibility after the blackout in 2003 to an organization called the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC. Uh, they set reliability standards for most of uh, the United States. And then within different regions of the country, as the systems might be different, there are regional reliability standards, and we're part of the Northeast Power Coordinating Council. So uh, lots of folks setting reliability standards that we are responsible for implementing in the region. And then as you look on the, uh, the center and the right, there's really two groups of what we call our stakeholders. Uh, there would be the Neepool market participants. They are the folks who actually own uh, resources in the wholesale market. They have a number of sectors. Uh, the newest of those sectors is the alternative resources sector. It's been in place since 2005 when FERC sort of anticipated lots of smaller renewable alternative technologies coming into the market, making sure that they have a voice in the stakeholder process. And uh, they have a lot of technical and stakeholder meetings that take place throughout the month. Uh, we're very much a part of that. And in, uh, in Vermont, the Public Utilities Commission is very active in engaging in that NEPOOL stakeholder process. And then on the right side of the chart, do you have, do you have a question? Yeah, just a very quick one. Um, on the top here, when we look at FERC and the uh, North American, can you just explain the difference in uh, who they're accountable to? Right. So uh, FERC is an independent federal agency, and they are subject to uh, congressional oversight. Okay. So their uh, commissioners uh, would appear before the House Energy and Commerce Committee as an example to talk about how they are managing reliability for the for the nation. And NERC? And, uh, and uh, NERC is an entity that ex existed before the blackout. Um, it was sort of a voluntary association among all of the, uh, the utility companies, but it was given more formal authority after the blackout. They actually set reliability standards that are mandatory. So as a very simplified example, if you own a power plant and you commit to an ISO that I'll be able to run you know, the next day or for the next week and we commit you, mm -hmm. there are now financial penalties if they can't perform. If they took the risk that the machines are not operational and they make a commitment to the ISO, there's some very significant financial penalties that they would have Who to pay. So NERC would report to FERC. So you can kind of think of Congress, mm -hmm. FERC, NERC, NPCC, okay. and then the ISO. Um, and then on the, uh, the far side, we have a lot of state uh, public officials who are involved, both public officials directly and then many of their staff. Uh, happy to meet with the legislators and talk about the work we do. Our primary interaction is with uh, the public utility commissions or the uh, consumer advocates or uh, state regulators in the state. So depart we work with the department pretty closely in Vermont. Uh, we work with environmental uh, regulators, and then in some states they have an energy board or commission. But the PUC is really day-to-day -day most involved with the ISO. Uh, so this is just a quick uh, look at what you would see if you came down to uh, the control room picture, a, a, a large billboard, uh, 60 feet wide, 20 feet tall, fully digital, um, and it's showing the full transmission system for uh, New England, and we can see what's happening in the Maritimes. We can do a wide area view, see the entire country. You can see the direction of power flows. You can see if there's overloads on the system. You can see all the alarm bells that go off if bad things happen on the system. And uh, it's a great real-time snapshot. Uh, I mentioned uh, planning. So NERC sets reliability standards. Uh, we want to make sure that the transmission system can handle the loads that we forecast, how much demand there's going to be. If transmission lines get overloaded, they actually heat up beyond their capability. 
Uh, we look at thermal issues around that. We want to make sure that the, low, the lines aren't going to overload, sag, and potentially make contact with the ground. So there are reliability standards set for that. Um, lots of other technical aspects that we can explore if you want to come down and uh, talk with the team that uh, administers those standards. And then anybody who wants to interconnect to the bulk transmission system, they come to the ISO. We do uh, an engineering assessment of the project. We want to make sure that it can connect reliably to the system without upsetting the reliability of anybody else who's tied in to the network. We don't look at the benefits of those interconnections. We don't say, well, it would be a really good idea if this project went forward because we're administering a competitive market. So the people who are developing projects take the risk that it makes sense to build the project in this area, whether that's a power plant, a uh, solar farm, gas-fired unit, or even transmission to interconnect to another part of the transmission network. Um, and each year we do a planning process with our stakeholders. In uh, 2019, that will culminate in a public meeting in Boston. And we'd be happy to have uh, representatives from Vermont participate. Um, we'll have the regional system plan, which will be uh, discussed. It'll be in a draft form much earlier than that. But it's a way for New England and all the stakeholders that we talked about in the previous slide to come together and, and talk about the vision for the future of the system. Um, uh, do you see demand growing over the next 10 years or staying level? We're, we're going to get to that specifically. Okay. Um, but we've seen it slowed pretty substantially and, and, and in fact, is dipped negative. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why. Uh, if we think about the grid, we think New England, six states, 14 million people, that's a pretty big region. If you think about the fact we're tied into a transmission network that spans from the Rocky Mountains uh, to the East Coast and as far south as Florida, you can see that we're one part of a very large system. Uh, why does this matter? And if, if you recall in August when we had the blackout in 2003, uh, the system around the Cleveland area um, became a problem. The operators lost control of that system. They were not communicating with other regions in this interconnection. And by the time they lost control, it took about nine seconds for that outage to cascade to the East Coast. Uh, New York City went black. Parts of Southwest Connecticut went black. Most of the rest of New England was unaffected by that. Uh, but that really ushered in uh, NERC's authority for setting those reliability standards to make sure if you're managing a system and you're having reliability problems, you're communicating with your neighbors because they can be impacted by that. Uh, we are connected to Quebec. So you'll see that Quebec is in gray. Uh, everything in orange is part of the alternating current or AC network. So power flows based on what the demand is in the system. Our interconnections with Quebec are direct current or DC ties. So the power is scheduled to flow in one direction at a time over that cable. It can go either direction, but it's typically scheduled as an import into New England. Just a quick question about it. advantages to one or the other? Um, DC? The DC is typically used for transmitting power over long distances, so and there's less less uh, loss. Yeah, I think that's I think that's part of the the consideration. Um, it's also used to interconnect neighboring regions that may have uh, um, different reliability requirements. The the last transmission line that was interconnected to the New England system crossed. Long Island Sound from New York into Connecticut, that's a DC cable. So when there's communication between control areas like ISO New England, they're often AC, uh, often DC lines. And anything that's been proposed between New England and Quebec going forward would also be direct current transmission. And the advantage to AC lines within the eastern interconnection? Yeah, it's, is it's um, the power is able to flow wherever the demand is. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges, flexibility. The, there's flexibility. One of the challenges for the DC is you have to have a converter at each end. Those tend to be pretty costly capital investments. Um, so you usually figure out where that power has come from. In uh, New England's case, we get power from the James Bay region up in Quebec, about 1,000 miles north of where we are today. And so you have a converter station on both ends. If you were to try and drop that power off along the way, there would be more cost to convert that from DC to AC. They're typically it's the express bus, yeah, essentially. <laughs> essentially. So you don't have those types of converter requirements on an pulse AC system. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we think of the transmission system as the um, interstate highway for electricity. This is the map that we've uh, left behind. So what you're looking at is not the highway routes. These are the 
uh, lines that form the backbone of our system. Everything that's shown here in blue is the 345,000 or 345 kV network. And uh, this really spans uh, throughout the system in each of the states. Uh, some of the green is showing 230 kV lines. We have some of that coming uh, through the Quebec corridor down into New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And then the red is the 115. That's the, essentially the lowest voltage that we operate. Um, most of our imports um, come from Quebec. And last year, about 17% of the energy that New England used uh, came from imports. Uh, so we tend to see power flowing from north to south and then from New England into New York. Uh, you asked about what's happening with uh, demand. Uh, we have seen uh, the summer peak in New England um, back in 2006, and we haven't seen it since then, uh, not at the levels that we saw back then. So 28,130 uh, megawatts, that was during a heat wave. But in the interim, we've seen a lot of investment in energy efficiency, a lot of investment in solar, PV, in addition to a lot of changes in the economy after 2000, 2008. Uh, so the demand has dropped down and really has not got back uh, to those levels. And then in the wintertime, we see a peak as well, but that's much lower than the summer peak. And if you look at peak as a measure, uh, peak demand for a number of years was growing 1% to 2% annually. So that requires a lot of infrastructure to be built to support that growth. Um, with the energy efficiency and PV, we've seen uh, peak demand slow, and it's actually dipped negative. Uh, as a region, we're seeing that same phenomenon uh, here in Vermont as well. And then if you look at all 8,760 hours in a year, the energy that we use as a region, we've seen that uh, flatten and in some cases go negative uh, as well. So that's a system without heavy penetration of electric vehicles. And uh, if we see a big deployment of those technologies, then we could see the demand uh, increasing in the future. Uh, we have about eight... Um, 350 generators that we can dispatch or monitor from our control center in New England. The largest of those are the nuclear stations. Uh, the second largest would typically be the uh, natural gas-fired resources. Um, we have a lot of resources that are proposing to interconnect to the system. And again, those are the projects that we study through our queue process. Uh, most of that is wind and gas. And we'll give you some numbers on that shortly. We've also seen a lot of resources retire. So when you think about the uh, we've called the fuel security or any energy security challenges. Some resources that have provided round-the-clock power supply with on-site fuel storage, um, nuclear, coal resources, those are retiring. They're being replaced with technologies that are very much dependent on the weather, whether it's solar, or offshore wind. So are the resources that are coming in going to come on fast enough and on a scale to replace the resources that we know we can count on when we call them for dispatch? Yes. Um, your uh, uh, the proposed generation is that um, wind is offshore these days. Both, Florida? both, and we'll show a breakout of where that okay. appears. And and is this um, generation that has permits in place? It depends, um, and I can talk a little bit about that when we show the the, the split of those resources. Okay. Um, in New England, from the design of our markets in the early 2000 time frame. Um, driven largely by the interests of the states, we've said we want to make sure there are opportunities for energy efficiency to participate in the wholesale markets, uh, specifically through the capacity market. So we have lots of what we would think of as uh, demand resources. It's uh, something on the uh, customer side of the meter that has the ability to either curtail or shift their operation. And to a grid operator, a, a, a megawatt that would come from a demand resource is just as good as a megawatt that would come from a power plant if you're ramping up. So um, we have seen a lot of active demand response where somebody's, uh, you know, throttling the switch or turning something on and off, and passive demand resources, which would be energy efficiency. Once you install the energy efficient lighting or more efficient uh, heating system, it's providing reductions in the demand <coughs> continuously. So uh, we're seeing a lot of that in, in the region Just as well. Just a quick clarification. Yep. So, so the, the forward capacity market is future savings, sort of like a yes. futures market in savings or something like that? Yes. So it's on a three-year uh, forward basis. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to run an auction in the beginning of February, and it's looking three years into the future. What are the needs in that time frame? Mm -hmm. And Is it a rolling three years? You do that yes. every year? Yes, every yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, so we buy the full requirements for what it will be in the June 1 through May 31st time frame that spans the three years in that time frame. Okay. So when you have a utility uh, bid in to that, um, uh, so you have a legislative committee like this one that then um, seeks to you know, impact their bid two years down the road. You know, they've been in for three years, but it's rolling, so they come in every year, right? So, so if we try to change their um, something, if we took an action that impacted um, their ability to meet that obligation, how would you handle that? Well, they need to think about what the risks are for their ability to perform if they participate in the auction period. There, there's lots of things that could happen. Their, their ability to complete construction on their project, and we've seen issues there. Um, their ability to procure fuel, you know, three years into the future. Uh, if they are committed to our auction, if they're one of the lower price resources that gets selected, they have a, what we call a, a capacity supply obligation. There's probably nothing that you could do directly that would unwind their obligation, but they would need to think about what might be happening in the policy framework in the state where I have a resource that might affect my ability to participate um, in the market. So, uh, are you asking about savings in particular about for capacity market or just in general market? Yeah. So that's a really a risk that they would have to think about, and I'm not sure the particular resource they have. Yeah, that but, framing is just. Yep. Yep. Um, so when we think about the markets we administer, uh, the energy market right now we're drawing energy from. The, from the grid, and that's by far the largest of the markets in the sort of the time frame when prices were higher in 2008. This was a $12 billion market for the New England region. Uh, in years like 2012, when fuel prices really dropped after the economy slowed down and after the fuel started coming out of the Marcellus uh, Shale Basin, we saw the value of the wholesale energy market uh, contract pretty significantly. And then if you look year to year, why is there volatility here? It's some years we have a really cold winter. The demand for fuel goes up, the price of fuel goes up, and the price of electricity at the wholesale level goes up as well. If you look at 2016, you might say, well, what was going on there? Well, it was really warm winter time, and uh, I don't have to tell a community that relies on skiing and tourism. If it's a, if it's a tough year for uh, the tourism industry in um, in Vermont, it's probably a year when you're going to see lower prices in the wholesale market. And there's just that correlation. It's all driven by the weather. Yes? Um, I, looking at, at the first two, 2008, 2009, I would assume that a lot of that is driven by economic recession as yes. opposed to weather. So y year to year, the weather is a factor. Um, we're seeing it more in the recent time frame with constraints on the gas pipeline. But if you look at 2008 to 2009, um, our team would say that was a direct correlation to the slowdown in the economy. And actually, I think we have another chart that shows that a little bit more closely. Uh, so the second market we administer, the Ford capacity market, uh, this is influenced by who is uh, committing to stay in the market, uh, <coughs> who's retiring, and who wants to develop or build uh, new resources. That market has been around a billion to two billion dollars uh, for most of its history. And in recent years, we've seen some pretty large retirements of resources around the system. Uh, the Vermont Yankee system uh, plant retired, the you know, Salem Harbor Station north of Boston retired, Pilgrim Station in Massachusetts will be retiring. And these tend to be really large assets, so they have an impact on the balance between the supply and the demand. So we've seen higher prices in our capacity market in the years when we've seen those big retirements. Okay, so that increase, yeah. so that, increase um, that we're seeing the value of the Ford capacity market is really an expression of concern about the, what's going to be available. That's right, right. And to uh, Representative Campbell's point, as a forward market, uh, these prices for 2018 were really related to the auction we held several years ago when we saw the retirements. So it's not related to the instant activity. Mm -hmm. It's depending on when they come in for retirement. So we're running an auction uh, in February, and I expect these prices will likely be much lower because we're not seeing uh, large-scale retirements in this auction. But 
those results will be available in public. So what we're seeing there is an expression of concern by our possibly could be construed as an expression of concern about um, how much energy is going to be available in the future by our utilities. And is that from 2015? Right. Looking at the increase in the forward capacity, the in value. 2018. Of it, yeah. But those those bids were made in 2015. Right. right. So what's coming next? Right. Um, we, we have lots of resources that want to participate in this auction, so I wouldn't frame it as we're concerned there won't be enough resources. Uh, more participants enter the auction every year than we need. Some of them are priced really high, and they never get selected. The ones that are priced lower are the ones that come out of the auction with, a, with an obligation. Is there, I, I think what you're asking is, is, is it an expression of constrained supply? It sounds that, like something I may need to take off. Yeah, I would say it's a it's a it's related to the amount of retirements. It's directly related to the amount of retirements yeah, that of, we're of seeing. Generating seeing. capacity. That's correct. Would, yeah. would you? I would phrase it: the the supply has become smaller, so the price is is higher. It's right. where it's where supply and demand meet right. in the auction. Yeah. Right. yeah. So if they're retiring, there's that chunk of supply is gone. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how I think. Which makes it. savings more valuable or more expensive. Okay. Um, if we think about the resource mix, uh, was that a comment? I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm just trying to understand. That's all. Okay. I, I'm keep going, keep mindful going, of going. the time. So, the uh, the system has evolved pretty significantly in the time frame we've administered the markets. If you look back to 2000, which is the blue, uh, you can see that uh, oil and coal provided about 40 percent of the energy in the region. That's essentially fallen off the map in uh, the 2018 time frame that shift has gone towards natural gas. So as a region, we've built lots of gas-fired power plants. Uh, that's what is serving most of the load uh, on an annual basis, about half. If you look at our website in real time, uh, in the summer and spring, you might see that that is 60% or more. So this, the region has really shifted to gas, and it's largely because the price of that fuel most of the year is uh, cheaper than anything else that they can use to produce electricity. Um, we're not developing a lot of hydro in the region. We are seeing an escalation in renewables. It's not really dramatic on this chart, but we also know that the standards that the states have set through renewable energy standard, renewable portfolio standards, those numbers are going to go up. And we expect the renewables to, to track that. Um, this looks also at where we get our energy mix from, but also shows the imports as a part of it. So last year, 40% from gas, 17% from imports. Nuclear is at about a quarter. We know that's only going to shrink. Nobody's proposing to build more in the region, and we're only going to lose what we have on the system. Um, th this chart shows the volatility that we see at the wholesale level for natural gas uh, fuel prices and the electricity prices. So anytime there's a physical constraint on the system, gas prices go up. We saw this as far back as the 2015 when the hurricanes hit the Gulf. Lots of infrastructure got wiped out. A lot of price volatility. As soon as that infrastructure came back, prices settled down. Uh, those are pretty volatile prices for New England, but we've seen in uh, recent years that the physical constraints in the pipelines in the wintertime have driven lots of volatility. And you saw that to some extent in the annual numbers, but you can see on this chart, you know, the three years around 2012 through 2015, we had really cold winters, lots of volatility in the wholesale market for price warm winter period, things settle down. And then last year, we saw uh, really cold temperatures in this time frame. And that drove up prices, which really influenced the wholesale price for um, the retail price for the next round of bidding. Um, we talked about some retirement. So this is an illustration that we're moving really toward a hybrid grid away from uh, building uh, conventional generation to more renewable generation. Uh, some of that renewable is offshore, very large wind farms that are proposed, uh, but a lot of it is distributed, tied into the distribution system, and uh, largely with uh, solar PV. Um, so that shift is uh, happening now and, and, and pretty rapidly. I mentioned the retirements. We've seen about 5,000 megawatts of resources retire. And we have another 5,000 that we would say are at risk for retirement. If you think about a coal or an oil plant that only produces about 1% of the region's electricity, um, 
their utilization rate is so low on the grid, it's just hard for them to keep operational. Think about a manufacturer that's only producing 1% of the, the system's uh, demand for energy. It's kind of hard for them to stay in business. Um, with this transition from resources burning coal and oil to natural gas, we've seen a big shift in the emissions. So by a couple of measures, uh, NOx, SOx, and CO2 emissions have dropped pretty dramatically. Um, that's looking at a calendar year basis for uh, SOx. It's 98% reduction since 2001, and that's really because we're not burning as much coal in the region. Uh, the emissions do tend to spike in the winter when there's a lot of cold weather, so those coal and oil plants that are still around, they haven't retired yet, they tend to run during a cold snap, and the emissions profile for the region does change, but most of the rest of the year, they're not operating. Um, Another thing that's driving the change in the resource mix, each state in New England in some form has adopted a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the targets are in the 80% range. That's below the 1990 levels. And the time frame for that is the year 2050. Um, the northern New England states have adopted goals that we would say are more aspirational. Uh, the southern New England states have adopted goals that are backed up by the legislative mandate and there's a strategy in place to get to that. So this is just reporting what we see for the region, but obviously um, legislators are directly in control of this level of policy making for Vermont and the other states. Uh, there's a question about the uh, interconnection queue. So this on the left-hand side shows the resource mix. Uh, wind, over 13,000 megawatts proposed for the region. Uh, that's overtaken natural gas, which used to be the primary resource, but a lot of the activity by Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island to procure offshore wind is driving developers to apply to, ne to connect to the system. Uh, we're seeing solar on a grid scale show up. Uh, we're seeing battery storage. If we, the last time we were up here, maybe two years ago, I think we talked about 50 to 100 megawatts of battery storage connecting to the grid. Now that number is over 1,000, and it's out of date every time we print it. There's lots of activity for uh, energy storage. Um, uh, fuel cells have shown up as well. That's a technology that's we're seeing in Connecticut specifically. So, so then you can see for Vermont about 200 megawatts of what's uh, proposed for the system. Uh, battery storage, is, is that literally batteries or is that other forms of storage? It's typically storage? electric uh, storage in the form of a battery. Yeah. So not, I know pumped hydro, there's not, there's no little pumped hydro storage right. happening, but would that be included in battery storage? Uh, that would probably, we would probably treat that in a different category. Uh -huh. um, we, we've seen some uprates to the existing pump storage hydro facilities. They can ring out some more efficiency mm -hmm. and get a few more megawatts. That would show up in the queue, but we haven't seen any proposals for many years to develop yeah. more pump storage hydro. Uh, the renewables are clearly on the rise. Uh, each of the states, as we mentioned, has some for, of target for renewable energy. Uh, this chart uh, shows Vermont is sort of embedded because it blows the scale. In Vermont, you think of a large-scale hydro as a renewable resource. It doesn't really match up with the other states' version of uh, renewable portfolio standards, but directionally, all the states you know, are seeking more renewable energy in time. And if you think back 2018, the numbers didn't look a lot different from the year 2000, but as you move forward to 2025, 30, 40, we expect our system's going to be a lot more renewable in terms of the makeup of the, the grid. Um, uh, Trending-wise, energy efficiency, the states as a region are spending over a billion dollars a year, and that's all collected through retail uh, uh, charges and supporting energy efficiency measures for <coughs> residents, consumers, uh, business, um, commercial and industrial. Solar PV, which was about 40 megawatts a couple years ago, uh, through the end of last year is over 2,000, and we're expecting almost 6,000 megawatts of solar PV on the grid by the end of the next decade. So very fast-growing resource in the region. And uh, wind, about 1,000 megawatts has developed. Big shift in the thinking around wind. It used to be the expectation it would be in uh, northern Maine, um, but the states have looked at offshore as well, and that really has sort of overtaken the, uh, the development. And, You've got these slides, so I'm just going to cruise a little bit deeper into the
presentation, when we think about uh, what's happening with solar as it affects the grid, much of the solar that's interconnected is not tied into the transmission network. So the grid operator can't see it. Unless there's a really large solar farm that <coughs> isn't serving a customer, um, those would connect to the transmission system. We're starting to see some of that, uh, but most of it is rooftop solar or smaller arrays. So the challenge for us is figuring out, okay, what's the load going to do in the region when there's all these resources on the other side of the meter that are not visible to us? So we've developed a lot of forecasting capability. And this is a pretty dramatic example, real world from last April. And the dotted line at the top is what the demand would have been if uh, it was served at the grid level, but you add in lots of solar and the, uh, the demand in the afternoon, which is typically the peak period, fell below the overnight hours. So we expected that would be coming at some point, and uh, it's a pretty significant change in how our operators have to respond to what the weather's going to be like. Um, does, that, does that factor into the forward capacity uh, prices? Well, this is looking at a real-time yeah. operations, um, but certainly there are opportunities for all resources to participate in the forward capacity market. I, I guess what I was thinking of, of was uh, when you don't see anything what's happening behind the meter. Right. So as more uh, behind the meter renewable energy is installed, is that taken into consideration the form of capacity uh, prices? Um, I, let me think about that one. Maybe we can talk about that offline. I don't have a specific answer on that. Yeah, probably just don't understand forward capacity enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it, within Vermont, we do a PV forecast, solar uh, PV for New England, and you can see how uh, Vermont sort of stacks up within the forecast that we do. And um, I know there's lots of uh, solar development you know, in, in, in the southern New England states, but also in Vermont. And then you can see geographically where it shows up the highest concentrations uh, for Massachusetts primarily. It tends to sit on top a lot of the load, but we see that in Vermont as well. And uh, we mentioned batteries, lots of battery storage technology coming in. Uh, uh, this is not a new chart. We've talked about this in the past. In addition to power plants that want to get developed in the region, lots of interest in developing resources in uh, eastern Canada with transmission to deliver that into the New England market. So these are not specific projects, but directionally we have uh, lots of interest in doing this. Uh, we have more than a dozen projects uh, competing to do that through some type of uh, transmission into the region, and most of those projects are tied in to some form of an RFP with uh, the southern New England states. And I'll just wrap up with a couple of ways that folks in Vermont can and are engaged. We have a consumer liaison group, which was established uh, about almost a decade ago, and it's an opportunity to provide a non-technical forum for discussion about uh, regional issues. The consumer advocates in the region, the PUCs, uh, are all involved in that. The topics for those meetings are set by the coordinating committee for the CLG, so it's a, a very active stakeholder group. And uh, Dina, I don't know if Dina's in the room, Dina. Frankel, she's the newest member of the CLG Coordinating Committee, so she's at, at all these meetings. Um, we have a report coming out for the CLG, and then I mentioned the Regional System Plan meeting in Boston. That's going to be September 12, and uh, Molly is a, a regular participant at the Vermont System Planning Committee meeting, sharing updates on what's happening in the region, and then taking back what uh, Vermont is putting forward as priority, so our team back in Holyoke can kind of build that into our planning as well. So uh, we've also got some uh, profiles, which are a snapshot of uh, the New England system. And then I didn't tell you about this at the beginning because you would <coughs> stop listening to me and download it on your phone, but we have a, an app which gives you the real-time pricing for the New England region, for each state in the region. You can see what the fuel mix is. Well and uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave you with, with the app. That's uh, usually more popular than just about anything except the control room tour. <laughs> so I, I think I'm up about a minute over. You nailed it. Okay. Nailed it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mark. Very I have one more quick question. Uh, oh, probably yes. Actually, I'm going to ask you this. Well, um, so yes, we, we, okay. No. <laughs> I'll be in the hallway. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Well.
So I'll jump in. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. My name is Patty Richards. I'm from Washington Electric Co-op. I don't have an app today, so you guys are going to so no take there. over technology. <laughs> so it's a very interesting contrast to hear from the ISO New England and then hear from Washington Electric Co-op, because we're one of the smaller utilities in the state. We just talked about a 28,000 megawatt regional system, and now I'm going to talk about a 16 megawatt distribution local electric utility system here in Vermont. Um, so again, I'm Patty Richards. I'm the general manager at Washington Electric Co-op. Um, saying hi to Avram, who's a, who formerly worked with Avram. Uh, Avram used to be the general manager at WAC. I'm um, going to also recognize Steve Bolton. Did he scoot out on me? He was one of my board of directors, uh -huh. um, but he's He's uh, scooted out, so I'll just jump in. Yeah. So again, uh, Washington Electric Co-op will give you a little bit of uh, just information about us, uh, some talking points, and um, this really is an overview of who we are. And I can try to answer some of the questions that you may have on some of the market issues. I'm also a power supply planner by trade. I've been doing power supply planning for about 30 years in, in Vermont in a consulting capacity, so I can maybe answer some of the uh, forward capacity market questions that came up from a from a utility standpoint and how that affects rate payers. I can yeah. hopefully if, flush if that out. If you want to layer that into your discussion, you can get it Okay, I'll I'll try to jump in. So what I've got up here on the on the uh, screen is a map of the state, and in yellow is Washington Electric Co-op service territory. We are small electrically. We serve about eleven thousand customers. We call them members because our customers actually own the co-op, we're not for profit, um, but electrically we're very small. We're about 1% electrically of the state. The state is about 1,000 megawatts, to put it in scale, we're 16 megawatts, we're tiny. But land area, geographically, we're 17% of the state. We're 41 towns, and what that means is we're really rural. We have eight customers per mile. That contrasts with a GMP that's around 20 customers per mile. Burlington Electric Department is around just under 90. So we're the least dense, most rural uh, utility, electric utility in the state. And our biggest, some, our biggest cost drivers are actually wires and poles, transmission uh, or electric distribution infrastructure. Our power supply is fairly inexpensive. We're about nine cents a kilowatt hour before we sell renewable energy credits. The rest of our cost is around 12 cents a kilowatt hour is the wires and poles the infrastructure to get to our eight customers per mile. And I've jumped around, I've done this presentation a few times, so I'm gonna uh, leap around a little bit. Um, one of the things you heard from the ISO New England was they're talking about generation bidding into the market, forward capacity market is really a generator's market where the generator bids in in this three year forward look. From the utility standpoint, load also pays in that market. So think about the ISO New England as a pass through of money. They take money from load and they transfer it over to generation. That they sit in the middle and they make sure it's done on a fair basis. So as an electric utility here in the state, we both serve load and we also own <coughs> generation. So WEC participates in the forward capacity market because we own generation. We own the Coventry landfill plant, which burns methane at the Coventry landfill. Uh, we have a purchase power agreement where we take uh, um, energy from the Sheffield Wind Project. We have New York Power Authority. Power. So we're fully immersed in the ISO New England's market rules, but we sit and represent both load and generation, and that makes us in the state of Vermont what's called a vertically integrated utility structure. We did not deregulate. We're allowed to own both generation and serve load together. Whereas all the other New England states <coughs> made a ruling, the state said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna break those two things apart. In the state of Vermont, we own both. So what that allows us to do is we serve load and then we go and either own generation or we buy contracts to hedge that, what's happening in the ISO New England marketplace. And that was a whole lot of words. <laughs> but basically, we sit on both sides of that equation, generation and load. I have a quick question for you, Patty. I, yes. I should know this after the presentations we've had this week, but um, how unique is that in Vermont? Um, 
there are a number of obviously electric utilities. So I'm pretty uh, sure all the Vermont utilities have some generation some ownership, yeah. and they certainly hedged through power supply contracts. Yeah. The vast majority have some. They're not basically you could you could choose as an electric utility to completely take the wholesale market price yeah. and just let the market be your price point. And that's what the rest of New England has said, that's what they're doing. They just, whatever the market price is, that's what they charge their consumers. We in the state have said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna buy insurance, we're gonna pre-buy like our oil or our propane, we're gonna pre-buy for the year. And we do that through contracts, owning generation that basically insulate us from the volatility of the market. So when I say hedge, I'm basically, I wanna get away from that volatility that's in the wholesale market and own enough resources that I have some general sense of what my costs are going to be. Does it say on that slide um, what percentage of your load you produce relative to, to purchase? Yeah, and I'll get to that oh, okay. in a couple Great. slides. Yep. Um, so the co-op was established, just to give you a little bit of background about how we came to fruition. We were established about 80 years ago, in 1939, and the co-op was the rural, the hills, the outer reaches, when I got to, uh, to Washington Electric Co-op, I finally realized after about a year, if it's on pavement, we don't serve it. <laughs> we're, we're really the back, we're the r most rural area you can possibly find in some of the places where people live. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but we bring electricity out there. Um, and the, the, the reason I bring that up is the co-op was established because the investor-owned utilities at the time said that's too expensive to go get. So the co-ops came to be by um, federal act to say, okay, we want to get electricity out to these rural areas. Let's lend them low interest money and get electricity out to the rural areas. So that's how we came into um, to be. Um, um, Patty, the, um, there's a you know there's a telephone mandate to serve a, a customer. Is there an electrical mandate to offer electrical service to every yes. resident? Yes. Yes. Anybody that locates in our service territory, mm -hmm. we are required to offer electricity to them. It's part of the monopoly. The trade-off to being a monopoly is we have a chunk of customers that yeah. we get to serve, but also if somebody locates, we have to serve them. We can't say, oh, exactly, you're yeah. too far up that hill, we're not going to serve you. It's an obligation we have to serve. It's a nice trade-off. So I summarized how we are electrically size very small we're one percent of the state but towns were 17 percent of the state's land mass um, in our profile we're we're very different than many of the other utilities our profile of customers is 96 percent residential so we're very homogeneous we don't have a commercial industrial load that we can kind of bank on and like shift rates and costs to we're very much focused on the residential profile i don't know if that does that make sense just very much uh, residential bedroom communities, people driving out of our 41 towns and driving somewhere else to go to work. Um, we are uh, run by a nine member board of directors and the board of directors are all customers, members of the co-op. So they not only take electric service, they have to take electric service from us to be on one of our board of directors. Um, we hold annual meetings and we're very much proactive in reaching out to our constituents to get their issues, their wishes, and basically we are there to serve our membership and our customers and what they want us to do is generally what we do. So we take our direction from our constituents, from our members. Um, <clears throat> talked a little bit about this already, about our rural uh, characteristics, eight customers per mile. We are definitely the most rural utility in the state. Um, and why that really matters is especially during uh, power outages and that are driven by weather events. Because we have so many lines, um, our reliability issues are, you know, it's a big issue for us in terms of keeping the lights on. We have, we serve through the woods, through the pucker brush, so to speak. Half of our lines are off roads, so you have to specialized equipment to get to them. And uh, weather events really affect us. A lot of trees out there that are bringing down power lines. Um, our customer profile is made up of some very low users. Our average member uses 490 kilowatt hours per month, which is 12% lower than the rest of the state. And we've been working with our constituents and our members on this for several years through uh, energy efficiency incentives and energy efficiency um, 
philosophy and strategy. So slowly over time, our um, electric base has used less and less energy over time. A again, through weatherization, energy efficiency, and those kind of programs. A uh, little bit about WEC in terms of the power supply side. So WEC is 100% renewable. We've been 100% renewable for several years. And our biggest asset is the Coventry landfill plant, which produces about <laughs> two-thirds of our energy mix. And I'll show you a chart on that in a second. Uh, Coventry burns uh, methane gas that is a, a gentle vacuum that's taken off the landfill at Coventry to extract the methane gas. And we burn it in Caterpillar engines. There's five Caterpillar, Caterpillar engines up there for about eight megawatts nameplate rating. And that plant is projected to run for the next 20, 30, potentially 40 years. There's significant gas up there that this is a long-term asset. We also have a small uh, one megawatt uh, hydro plant called Wrightsville, which is near just north of here, Montpelier. Um, and that produces about 2 to 3% of our energy. We have a purchase power agreement in Sheffield Wind. And we have an, uh, power that we take from the small Vermont independent power producers. They're generally hydro plants. But the reason I call these particular resources out is you'll see the density of our power supply and how local it is, meaning it's in Vermont. The vast majority of our energy is not only renewable, but it's also Vermont-based. And the beauty of that is the dollars that we're spending trickle through the economy with the multiplier effect and really give a boost to the Vermont economy. Um, in terms of net metering, um, WEC early on was a, lar a significant leader in net metering. Back in 2014, when net metering was just starting to really pick up pace, WEC was at 11% of its peak in 2014. We far exceeded uh, uh, statutory uh, mandates, um, but that since then the cap has been lift lifted. We are now at 3.5 megawatts of solar installed in our system, and that is 22% of our peak and to put that in context of energy, I just did some math over here on the side. It is. Um, You're not math. Okay, my math. I wrote it down. I want to say it's six percent. So about four thousand megawatt hours, which equates to about six percent of our of our uh, retail load. So it's significant. So 3.5 megawatts to wash an electric co-op relative to a 16 megawatt scale, it's really, that's starting to really show up. It's, uh, WEC has given our rural nature, people have the ability to put solar because they, there's lot, lot, many fields, many open spaces and solar, um, the impact of solar in our service territory has been very robust, or the pace I should say. Uh, Wash Electric Co-op is also an, an early adopter of energy efficiency. We continue to emphasize that today in all of our programs. And in fact, in the Tier 3 uh, program, which is part of Act 56, is, which is the renewable energy standard that was passed in 2015, WEX, Wash Electric Co-op's emphasis in that program is weatherization. Many of the other utilities are doing uh, slightly different things. Our primary focus is to encourage people to weatherize their house and make it as tight as possible and then look at your fuel use to make sure that you're using and minimizing that, that, um, that um, how you're using it, whether it's electricity, heating oil, propane, you want to minimize that carbon footprint. So our real focus in tier three is weatherization. And in terms of our, what our power supply mix looks like, this is a uh, chart, it's a long-term chart for 20 years showing you uh, where our power comes from and also where our load level is. Black line at the top represents Washington Electric Co-op's energy load for all the constituents, 11,000 members that we serve electricity. So the black, time, black line is our target of what we have to serve, and all the colors are the resources, the generation power supply contracts that we secure, we have secured, purchased, owned to serve that load. So instead of being f uh, open in the wholesale market and exposed to the volatility, we're essentially hedged based on this resource mix. And the reason I put 20 years out um, in terms of a chart is to show you that we're 100% renewable today, but we're also 100% renewable for 20 years looking forward. So we, WEC is unusual in that we don't have a yawning gap. We don't have a supply mix that we have to replace. We've made investments, long-term investments for the foreseeable future for, our, for, our, uh, for all the customers that use electricity at Washington Electric Co-op. 
and I'll pause there. Is it typical for a utility to, to have more, you're planning for more resources than load? I, I don't understand the, you know, where you want to be around the, the black line of, of what your load is. Generally, from a power planning position, I want to be slightly less. And I, I don't mind buying a little bit from the market, yeah. but our purchase, uh, purchase decisions in the past have us essentially full up for the foreseeable future. And we're actually, even though this looks like we have a lot of excess, it's actually some months we're short, some months we're long over the course of the year, we have a little bit more than what we have for load. So we're just slightly more hedged. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is we can't necessarily say exactly how much our resources are gonna produce because it depends on the wind, it depends on the hydro mix at the time, or the hydro flows at the time, um, and Coventry. The Coventry plant is increasing production so we're seeing some more electricity being produced there. Yeah. Um, on your purchases from the Sheffield Wind Project, uh, are they projected to be producing out 25 years? So the Sheffield Wind Project will, uh, as long as there's wind, they'll be the, the turbines will be spinning. And they're, the turbine life is, I haven't been in the space for a while in terms of building a, a wind project, but the turbine life is, anywhere from 25 to 30 years, so long-term Sheffield will be there. In the event, in the event there's blade degradation, they will replace components, it's my assumption of the owners of the Sheffield wind facility. We buy a power contract from the owners, we don't own the facility. Right. But they likely, very likely would replace components to continue the operation of the facility. Okay. Yeah. The large group would be part of this chart. Uh, is that Coventry? That's Coventry. That Oh, that's commentary, not GMP. Yeah, no, it's all, we don't purchase power from GMP. Okay. So let me, let me give you a, a, a one-year <laughs> drill in as to where the power comes from. So that shows you over 20 years, we're full up, we've got our resources, we've made our investments, we've, we've incurred debt, we've built projects, we're good for the foreseeable future. This pie chart gives you a snapshot of where that power comes from on an annual basis. And, uh, the big maroon section, that's the Coventry uh, methane burning plant up in Coventry, Vermont, that extracts the methane off the landfill. Two thirds of our power mix, that's by far the big elephant in the room for us. The next biggest resource is from Sheffield Wind. We get about roughly 11% of our energy in the past year <coughs> came from Sheffield Wind. We get some power that comes from New York Power Authority, it's called NIPA Power. This is a very low a, a cost energy block for us. It's really cheap. We want to make sure that power continues to flow for us. And again, that's hydro-based. And all the other resources are smaller hydro, in-state hydro um, from the independent power producers, which I call VEPI. Um, we have the Rygate facility is a wood-burning plant in Rygate, Vermont. We get a small chunk of that. It's about 2% of our mix. And then in 2017, we had 2% market purchases, a very nominal amount question on Coventry. Um, it, the plans to expand the landfill or something with the landfill, is that affecting your planning yet or is that? Um, so the gas that's at the plant or at the landfill now is, would be is, sufficient to carry us for the 20 plus years. So the models that we're looking at for the content of the methane, there's sufficient uh, methane for us to continue to operate. The expansion will help us operate the plant and maximize maximize the generation. So from a from a, a standpoint of Washington Electric Co-op, we're definitely tied with the expansion and we want to see the landfill operate in a responsible manner. We're concerned about the environment. Um, WEC at being a 100% renewable utility is very conscious about that. So we, we've had a great partnership with Casella who owns the landfill and encouraging them to do the right thing and make sure that the landfills run responsibly. Your 2% market purchase, um, are you buying the grid mix or can you specify you want specific renewable? So when we went out to do that purchase, and this was a winter hedge for January and February, because that's when it's most expensive and that's when it's really crazy right now in the wholesale market. So we did a small purchase a couple years ago um, from a counterparty, it's a private counterparty where they would sell just like they would sell to a GMP <coughs> or BC or anybody else. We purchased a small amount of power just to hedge against what's happening in New England. So that where they get that power is generally from their portfolio of generating plants if they have them or if they're just speculating and buying it off the market. So I can't specify 
when I do a purchase power deal on the market, I can't specify um, that it's from a particular resource unless I've negotiated directly with that with that generating plant. So I'm wondering what that what kind of an impact that has on your 100% renewable claim because. Right, right now, you're exempted from the standard offer. So we bought we bought renewable energy credits mm -hmm. to make to green that piece up. Okay. So we purchased from the market, but then we bought renewability <laughs> to so cover our greenness on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the <clears throat> I assume like Coventry's baseline is yes, and but Sheffield is a it's a pretty large chunk that's intermittent. Mm -hmm. um, is is your like NIPA? purchases are those two also intermittent or is that baseline? So NIPA has a nice flow to it. So NIPA is large like Hydro-Quebec, so they mm -hmm. schedule it. So it's really more of a scheduled hydro plant. Um, it, has, it, it's, it does have a, a fairly solid flow. But if I look at, I look at it this on a portfolio basis, if I take a, a little bit of a resource that's intermittent like Sheffield, mm -hmm. um, but Sheffield actually has a really nice profile for us where it matches our residential load profile, so I really like the wind. Um, and I marry that with some Coventry, I marry that with some Hydro. We get a really nice mix of coverage. We've got a little bit sticking out in the wintertime during the peak periods, mm -hmm. and I can manage that by doing some market purchases. Okay. But in general, so again, the, the message I want to send is WEC has made significant investments, power supply procurements, built <coughs> generation. You know, we're looking at our load, we're managing that, you know, our, whatever, how all of our consumers use electricity. We're basically an aggregator buying power to serve this mix of 11,000 customers. And we do it with 100% renewable resources. Um, our message is this is what our consumer, consumers, our constituents have asked for. They've elected nine board of directors. The board of directors are elected in a democratic annual meeting or a, a voting process every, every three years. They have terms of three years. If people did not like our direction, they would vote the board off and replace them with somebody else. So we're following what our constituents want based on this democratic process. Um, one of the things I want to mention is relative to our resource mix, some of the things that we're grappling with right now are location of new generators coming into Vermont and what's that, what that's doing to our existing portfolio mix. So the northern part of the state has a lot of generation and very little load, and it doesn't have enough transmission capacity to move stuff around on a really efficient <coughs> basis. And I don't know if you've heard from Valco with this thing called SHI, it's a Sheffield um, Highgate external interface problem. <laughs> Washington Electric Co-op, the Coventry plant and the Sheffield Wind plant, about 75 to 80% of our portfolio is in the SHI area. So we're seeing the Sheffield plant, we're, we're seeing financial impacts from new generators building in this area, impacting existing generators that have already made financial decisions and have already constructed. So we're, we're definitely squarely in that space with the Shiai issues, but we would really like to see that solved. To me, it does not make sense to go build something today, and then two years down the road, build something new, and then turn off the thing that you just right. constructed, mm -hmm. you just wasted that asset. So we're really looking for solutions to maximize renewable generation in the state and not cannibalize existing resources. And, and what do you think the solution is? So the um, solutions are. It, it's definitely there's a transmission component to this where we need to build infrastructure in the, in the region to move power in and out so that we can we can get juice to flow. At the same time, it's important for you all as lawmakers to understand it's great to pass new laws and new legislation to incentivize solar being developed, renewables being developed, but there can be consequences that, you know, I, I sat through many meetings where people said, oh, this is going to lower transmission costs, this is going to um, help reduce losses, we're going to see, uh, you know, infrastructure is going to be able to handle all this. And I kept thinking, oh, no, we're going to have a capacity issue. At some point, we're going to exceed the system's capability. And here's where we are at today. And that's caused WEC to increase its rates by a little over a percent just because of the Shia issue. So it's having an impact. So we've got to build infrastructure now to fix this. And that can be- Increasing line capacity. That can be transmission lines, that can be, they call these uh, synchronous condensers, variable <coughs> speed drives at particular locations. So fancy equipment needs to get sprinkled around. But we also need to be conscious about 
where the next generator is constructed. Because if we fix it today for the current problem, then we plop down another 30 megawatt solar project or you know, even if it was a 50 megawatt natural gas plant or something, it's going to eat up that capacity. So one of the things we talked about was forward capacity market. I'm going to try to answer the question that was raised earlier. So on the load side, load pays. So we pay for all that, those billions of dollars to be transferred over to generators. So I'm concerned about the forward capacity market price that's set three years forward because the load side pays. I get credited on my generation. So I get, if the Coventry plant gets paid, so it's almost like I'm taking money from this pocket and I'm putting it in the other. But if I, if, if I have enough capacity resources and generators, I can cover my load obligation. Um, but what's happening right now, so for Washington Electric Co-op, we're short a little bit on the capacity side, so the price point, when it's when it pops like that, it translates into rate pressure for Washington Electric Co-op because we, we're a little bit short on the capacity side. So if I'm a generator and I see a high price point, that sends to the market, it's a price signal to say, build generation. We, wanna, we want you to build generation. So three years in advance, they say, you're going to get paid nine dollars, you know, a kilowatt month. That tells the marketplace to go build generation, and then once you build that generation, then the price generally comes back down and floats down and kind of settles down. Does it overcorrect? Um, with that, I mean, is is there volatility because of the the um, uh, Capacity comes online in chunks. It doesn't yes, come exactly. in small streams. Right. So I, I, I would imagine that would drive it's, volatility. In it's that. very lumpy. Yeah. And the capacity market was set up to give a revenue stream to the generators so that they could stay in business, so they weren't mm -hmm. closing up, taking the keys, and sending the keys to the bank. It was an intentional market to assure that we have enough generating plants out across New England to keep the lights on. But it's very, it's very, like you said, it's building chunks. You don't build really granular. So it is a clunky market, in my opinion. It's an expensive market. We've had rate increases just due to the forward capacity market. Any other questions, Mike? Yeah. When you, <clears throat> to increase uh, transmission capacity, what kind of line has to go in? Do you have to have like a high voltage line going in? Or do you, uh, you go from two phase to three phase? Or? What so it's it's a, so I'm not an electrical engineer, but <laughs> the 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 story and the solution around the Shi'i deals with voltage issues and thermal issues. So thermal being the lines get too hot and they burn up. Mm -hmm. So th the fix is not a simple. You just expand. You put a higher voltage line up there because you have these thermal. There's a there's a play off of both sides, mm -hmm. and it's not. This is where the engineers get um, really technical and get into the weeds on this. But there's several things that need to happen on the on the transmission system to fix this with reactive power, um, <coughs> bigger capacity lines to move power, and funky equipment that variable um, AVR equipment and synchronous condensers. There's a, a set of tools in the toolbox to throw at this, and it's not as simple as running a new power line. It's it is complicated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Appreciate it. So we're going to start at one, and um, uh, I think go until two, so just an hour. But if we can start uh, presentations, there's the Energy Action Network presentation, and then there's the prepared testimony on presuming the presentation. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, so I'm going to start us up here, uh, just to keep you guys on the time and, and us as well. Um, welcome. And uh, my understanding is that uh, you're going to take about uh, 40 minutes of your presentation. That would be great. I, uh, Mr. Hughes will take uh, another uh, 20 minutes or so after that. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Very glad to be with you today. Um, uh, I uh, serve as the executive director of the Energy Action Network, um, which I'll speak more about briefly. Um, I know some of you and folks around the room from my previous uh, role working for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development 
where I served as economic development director responsible for business support and workforce development in our green economy and working lands sectors um, around the state. Um, but I uh, have served with Energy Action Network for the last two years, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that, our network and our model. Um, but mostly I want to focus on uh, Vermont's energy uh, and emissions commitments and our goals for our economy um, and where we currently stand and the scale and pace of progress that would be necessary to meet those energy and emissions commitments in a way that would improve the Vermont economy. Um, so if you don't mind, I will um, stand up. Uh, first, the Energy Action Network is a diverse network of over 200 members across Vermont, nonprofit organizations, businesses, educational institutions, finance institutions, really uh, a, a wide variety uh, politically, uh, business-wise, every, everyone from the Lake Champlain Chamber of Commerce to Green Mountain Power to Boren's Energy to Vermont Technical College. Um, and we all share one common mission, which is the same as the state of Vermont, which is to meet uh, the state's 90% renewable by 2050 uh, goals, total energy goals, um, and also to significantly reduce emissions. Um, it's important to state up front that Energy Action, a as a network, we have a small backbone organization that supports those 200 plus members in multiple ways. Um, one thing we commit to do is we do not do any lobbying or policy advocacy. We serve as a trusted, objective tracker of state progress. We work with state partners like the Department of Public Service, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, VTRANS, to uh, gather total energy and emissions data and share that with the network and across uh, Vermont. Um, so that benefits our networks, but it also benefits the state. And so if there's ever any way that I can be helpful beyond this presentation as a resource, please do not hesitate uh, to let me know. Um, but the, the main, uh, so the main story in terms of our energy goals um, that you are all familiar with, 90% renewable by 2050 across all energy sectors, is that as of last year, uh, Vermont was about 20% renewable. The first milestone of the comprehensive energy plan is 25% renewable, and we have a chance to meet that. However, almost all of this progress to get to this point has come from the increasing renewability of our electric sector and policies the legislature has, has passed from net metering to standard offer to the renewable energy standard. What, will, what is holding us back from further progress and what will be necessary to bend this curve upward is to make our transportation and our thermal sectors uh, more renewable, which are by far the f most fossil fuel dependent and high uh, emitting. So these pie charts break down Vermont's total energy use by sector. Um, uh, so you can see that overall, this is Vermont's energy use, 142 trillion BTUs, common, uh, use a common energy uh, unit. Um, these numbers are actually as of last year, so they're a little bit dated. Energy Action Network every year comes out with an annual progress report for Vermont that will be released in about a month. If any of you want to pencil or type some notes in, I can give you the most updated numbers, um, which are that transportation went up from being 35% of our total energy to 44% of our total energy. Um, some of this is an accounting change uh, that from the department based on switching over to the renewable energy standard and rec accounting, which I can talk about. Um, Thermal energy makes up 42% of our energy use. So together, those two sectors are 86% of our energy use. And electric is now 14% of our energy use. I should just quickly say, and we can get into it in more detail if folks want, that the, the department previously had measured electricity. And we follow their lead because we want to be tracking for the state and in full compliance with them. They had previously measured electricity as a source energy figure, so not just the energy that was consumed on site at the house. Uh, or at the building, um, but also all of the energy that went into bringing that electricity here, the transmission and distribution. We felt, they had felt that it was important to capture that energy that was used to bring that electricity to Vermont in the overall electric figure. And they were using end use or site energy figures for thermal and transportation. My understanding is to be consistent across all and because of the requirements of rec accounting or renewable energy credit accounting, uh, 
in compliance with the renewable energy standard, they're using site energy across all three sectors now to be consistent. And so that's where you get the 44% of our energy from in transportation, 42% in thermal, and only 14% in our electric sector. Is there any way to um, kind of backtrack and make it an apples to apples comparison, at least for one year? To be able to see yeah, that's hard. what we're doing in this year's report. Okay. So I'm sorry, this slide yeah, doesn't sure. have it, but yeah. we'll have it momentarily. Sure. And I can also update you on the share of that energy use that's renewable as of now. So um, electricity is now 63% renewable. The first target um, of the renewable energy standard was 55% renewable. The utilities have exceeded that, and our electricity is now 63% renewable post-REC accounting. Our thermal sector has gone down in its renewability because of increasing fossil fuel use. It's now 19% renewable, and our transportation sector is still stuck at only 5% renewable. And even that figure is... Um, it's mostly ethanol, which has dubious uh, life cycle emissions uh, problems. Um, so that's energy. But of course, the energy conversation is also a climate conversation because over 80% uh, of our uh, emissions come from our energy use across these sectors. And you can see um, that you know, this is data from the Agency of Natural Resources, their emissions inventory. 43% uh, of our emissions come from transportation, 28% <coughs> from building thermal, um, and only 10% from electric generation. Uh, so it's, it's clear that both to meet 90% by 2050, our renewable energy goals, and to meet any of the state's emissions goals, and there are multiple. The governor is committed to the Paris Climate Agreement, a 26 to 28% reduction below 2005 levels by 2025. The legislature has passed more ambitious statutory goals than that, but we are nowhere near on track to meet any of those commitments at, at this point. Um, as you can see from this slide, which shows that since 1990, Vermont's emissions have increased 16%. Uh, over the, la the last year we have figures for is 2015. From 2013 to 2015, our emissions increased 10%. And again, that was because of increasing use in the primarily the heating and the tra transportation sectors. Um, Can I uh, ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Clarification. Um, um, the the <clears throat> two slides back, the proportion, uh, that one, e either one of those. Yep. Um, so as <clears throat> load shifting happens, say yes. in thermal, yep. um, does the electrification of thermal get shifted over to electric? That's a great question. So the thermal still stays dirty, it just drops to a yeah. lower percentage of the loads? So what we have done <coughs> is basically from the EIA data and the state data that we've had, we've subtracted any electric use that is from cold climate heat pumps and from electric vehicles mm -hmm. um, and from heat pump water heaters and put them in their relevant. Yeah. Uh, so what we will see over time is, you know, so this electricity is really just appliances, lighting, things like that, but not vehicles and not heating systems, which would be captured in those two pie charts. So as I mentioned at the beginning, EAN does not advocate for one particular policy solution over another, but we do provide analysis that uh, to give a sense of if we're serious about meeting these commitments as a state what is the scale and pace of action that would be required and we don't look at policies but we look at known and proven technologies and best practices um, and so what are the technologies proven and available on the market today and what are the uh, emissions reduction benefits we could get from further adoption of those this is not meant to be prescriptive. We're not saying this is the way that Vermont has to do it. This is meant to be illustrative of, the, of what it would take. So, and we break it down by sector. So that would be, um, we're currently at about 2,800 ve electric vehicles in Vermont. For EVs, we count both full electric vehicles and partial hybrid electric vehicles, PHEVs. We would need, in the next six years, uh, to have 90,000 uh, additional electric vehicles purchased instead of new internal combustion fossil fuel cars. We, of the remaining fleet that's still internal combustion, we need to see an increase in that uh, fuel efficiency by 5%, and we would need to double transit, which is an all-inclusive figure, including uh, commuter patterns, bus, um, carpool, etc. On the 
so the single biggest driver we've identified is in electric vehicles. The single largest sector, sectoral opportunity, is in, in thermal, and that's because there are so many options for how to move away from fossil fuel heating to renewable heating, from heat pump systems to advanced wood heat systems through further weatherization and um, heat pump water heaters. Um, and so if you add all those together, that becomes significant. And there's additional uh, gains that we can make in, uh, in terms of emissions reduction from the electric sector as well. And then, of course, because energy is only 80% of our emissions, we reserve 20% to come from other sectors. This may be from agriculture, digesters, soil sequestration, and, and the like. Um, so for context, I mentioned we have 2,800 electric vehicles in Vermont in six years. We need 90, 000, an additional 90,000. We have a little over 10,000 heat pump systems in Vermont. Similarly, 90,000. Um, we would need an additional, we basically need to double the amount of wood uh, heating, although we would primarily, uh, this modeling is focused on the efficient systems like new efficient EPA certified pellet stoves and the automated pellet boilers, and 90,000 additional <coughs> home energy retrofits beyond the 25,000 that there are currently. Um, altogether, um, you know, th this, that would get us to, to Paris, and if you fall short in one, you'd have to, um, or the U.S. Climate Alliance target, it's also known as, you'd have to increase in another. <clears throat> While these numbers may seem large, especially to relative to where we are today, they're certainly technologically possible. And I can just provide a little bit more context. There are 335,000 housing units in Vermont, uh, as per the U.S. Census. So these goals would require just one third of Vermont housing units to be converted to a renewable heating, either cold climate heat pumps and or advanced wood heat over the next six years. Uh, likewise, there are approximately 44,000 new vehicles purchased in Vermont every year. The source for that is the Auto Alliance. And if that rate stays stable over the next six years, then we'd see 264,000 new vehicles sold in that time period. So again, if all, about one out of every three Vermonters making a new vehicle purchase uh, in the next six years opts for an electric vehicle, then we could meet that goal as well. Um, while there are certainly actions that all of us can take and roles for all of us to play, including renters and used vehicle owners, in this example, the main responsibility for achieving emissions reductions would be on those Vermonters who are owners of housing units and purchasers of new vehicles, those with the opportunity and more often than not more of the means to make these purchasing decisions. Um, and I want to pivot now to what I'm most um, familiar with given my background working with the state at the Agency of Commerce, which is the economic impacts of all of this. The status quo of our fossil fuel dependence is causing uh, really significant harm to our economy. We have about a $33 billion state economy. Uh, because of our spending on fossil fuels, we see about a billion and a half dollars drain out of the state every year. And that's because we have, of course, 100% imported fossil fuels roughly 78 to 80 cents on every dollar we spend on fossil fuels leaves the state. Um, not only that, but the prices for those fossil fuels are incredibly volatile and they're generally higher than their renewable counterparts. Uh, the purple line here is propane, the, f the uh, blue line here is fuel oil, whereas you can see in comparison wood pellets, cold climate heat pumps, wood chips are much flatter and more stable and uh, lower year-to-year -year price costs than the fossil fuel alternatives, which makes a big difference for family budgets in the middle of winter getting a big fuel oil bill. Can we interject a question? Yes. So, I'm sorry, and this is just kind of uh, occurring to me, but maybe something to talk about afterwards. So, we're hearing, you know, hearing a lot about how much natural gas um, yes. is on the grid. And so just thinking about that, this is just to people's homes, not... Right, this, you, this is, you, this, and natural gas is not on this, oh no, it is on this chart, it's, it's the gray line. So yeah. yes, it's certainly less volatile and a lower cost than the fuel oil or propane. Okay. Okay. But this is to people's homes, it's not... Because, yes, this okay, is... This is what I'm just rolling through my head. Thank you. <coughs> um, you know, so that was the heating sector. It's a similar story on the uh, electric side. This slide is a year old. I think the average price per gallon in Vermont now is something like two, 242 a gallon. Um, but again, this is dated. We say, we said Drive Electric Vermont has calculated that it's $1.50 a gallon equivalent to um, charge an electric vehicle. But we just saw earlier this week Burlington Electric Department come out with a residential EV charging rate that's the equivalent of 60 cents 
a gallon. So, um, you know, these continue to fluctuate, these continue to go down. But of course, there's the comparison around the maintenance costs, which are far lower for EVs, um, <coughs> you know, in, in emissions benefits. Um, and, you know, when you've got 78 to 80 cents on every dollar leaving Vermont that we spend on fossil fuels, it, it depends what renewable alternative you do instead and what your electric utility territory is. But in general, at least twice the amount of money is of your energy dollars are staying in state when you're doing using renewable when you're using electricity to run an EV as your transportation option as opposed to gas. So very good in terms of recirculating dollars locally and contributing to more local jobs. Um, here we see the growth in clean energy jobs in Vermont since 2013. We're now right around 19,000. Vermont holds the distinction of having a higher share of its workforce employed, employed in clean energy than any state in the country, 6% of our employees. Um, most of that is in weatherization and efficiency. Um, and this, the economic conversation is incredibly important because there's been a lot of misinformation about what taking steps to cap carbon or price carbon does to state economies. And we've done a comprehensive review of other states and provinces um, that have implemented such policies. And we've found no evidence, uh, and we've pulled from other people's analysis as well, that implementing such policies <coughs> causes any economic uh, negative benefit. Um, so you can see here, California is the only state in the US that has capped carbon economy-wide, uh, implemented the Western Climate Initiative in 2012. Their emissions, they've been able to drive their emissions below 1990 levels. Again, in comparison to Vermont, we're 16% above 1990 levels. Meanwhile, they've had some of the fastest economic growth in the country. This is not to imply causation um, or that Cal Vermont's economy is anything similar to California's, but it is to say that there's not evidence out there that capping emissions or pricing carbon harms a state economy. Um, you can see the same story in Quebec. Uh, they joined the Western Climate, Climate Initiative in 2012. Their emissions are back below 1990 levels, and they've had one of the strongest performing economies in Canada. And British Columbia uh, took a different approach. Instead of cap and invest, they did a carbon tax, similar story on emissions, and increasing GDP. We, we call these decoupling graphics. For so long, our, our economic um, growth was moved in tandem with our energy use, or, sorry, with our fossil fuel and emissions. Um, but now we're seeing through efficiency and through substitution of renewable alternatives that we are able to achieve economic growth while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I, I should reiterate here that EAN is not, I'm not endorsing any one of these policies. We have members who support expanding the REGI model to cover transportation emissions through the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Um, some support not joining California and Quebec in the Western Climate Initiative. Some support a revenue neutral carbon fee that would reduce uh, the sales tax. Others support the Essex plan or another policy. But what I do need to say is that it's clear that unless we do one of those policies or their equivalent, um, we will not be, we, it's almost impossible to meet the state's energy and emissions goals. And the reason for that is because if you look at this chart, it's also worth remi a reminder that Vermont already participates in a carbon pricing program, a cap and invest program, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and we do that to cover our electric emissions. Um, however, our electricity is only uh, makes up 10% of our emissions. Other states have benefited more from REGI because their electricity uh, generates more emissions. But you, we can only hope to make so much progress when our policy only covers this small sliver of our total energy use, whereas the places that are making the most progress in terms of reducing emissions and growing their economy have done an economy-wide or total energy approach to capping emissions. You see in California, they cover transportation. They cover thermal, same in Quebec um, and in British Columbia. Um, and I think that a helpful um, reference point in terms of why we've been able to see all of this progress on the electric side, but far less so on the transportation and heating side, is because we have policy and regulation and requirements and penalties and incentives on the electric side through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, through the Renewable Energy Standard. But in terms of those other sectors, we're working with vaguer 
less um, legally binding goals and commitments. Um, the Vermont Blue passed the statutory goal of its emissions reduction target in, uh, what was the year, um, a few years ago. Um, and you know, even though Governor Scott strongly committed to staying in the Paris Agreement and joining the US Climate Alliance when the president pulled it out, um, we are nowhere near on a path to actually meet that commitment. And so the clear evidence from across the country and across North America is that if you want to meet these goals, if you want to improve your economy, then you need to apply the policy and regulatory tools, including incentives and legally binding requirements to those other two sectors of our energy economy. Um, that's all I have prepared, but I am happy to, if we have time, I don't even know where we're at, I'm happy to take additional questions. You used half of it. Okay. I, I just have a general question, um, and this is going back to your uh, one slide before. Um, and as a precursor to this question, we had a presentation this morning from uh, uh, the folks at ISO New England. Yep. And there was something that they presented that I didn't actually, I hadn't even realized, that of the states that are in ISO New England, um, there are three states that have mandated greenhouse gas emission targets mm -hmm. relative to Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, which have aspirational. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, and um, you know, this is, I'm throwing this into the ether, but maybe yeah. you have an answer to it. Uh, I'm curious what Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island are you know, specifically doing to, um, you know, what are the penalties if they don't meet them? What are, you know, what are the very specific policy things that a mandated state does relative to an aspirational state? I doubt that none of those states have, um, uh, you know, a, a, a carbon tax on transportation fuels, for example. And that kind of leads back to this slide, which is California clearly is, um, you know, looking at mandated mm -hmm. um, uh, constraints on greenhouse gas emissions in particular sectors. We only have it on electricity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what is California doing in a mandated context to yeah. get to those mandated uh, reductions? Yeah. So for the California example, they have set up a cap and invest system where they set a target of what their overall emissions they want to be. And then they um, set uh, a certain number of allowances to basically pollute greenhouse gas emissions. And then they auction those off. Uh, I think the current price per ton is something like $19 in the Western Climate Initiative. Um, and uh, so then they, um, you know, they have that auction and th that market-based mechanism for those um, rights to emit, but it's it's covered at where all of that energy is entering the state in each of those sectors. I'm less familiar with, um, you know, I know Massachusetts has the Global Warming Solutions Act, which has a legally binding um, requirement um, that they meet their emissions reduction mm -hmm. targets. I think this has been less of an issue for Vermont because our um, electricity sector was always so low carbon intensive and we've never had a challenge meeting the reggie target so it's really just been a net boon to us i think 18.7 million dollars has gone to efficiency vermont alone to enable them to help from vermonters reggie. from reggie yeah, yeah. Um, but i think probably tom uh, in the next presentation may okay. have more information about um, what some of the other states are doing great I've got a question. Uh, that six percent figure that you're talking about that is employed in the renewable sector. Yes. Does that include um, specifically people that are, are designated in that category, or can it be any uh, plumber that installs heat pumps? Can it be any yeah. contractor that does a home project yeah. but not associated? So that number comes from the Clean Energy Industry Report, which is done annually by the Clean Energy Development Fund and the Department of Public Service, and it counts both full-time jobs and a share of overall employment. So it's counting, if you're doing uh, clean energy work for part of your, part, like so it's in, measured in FTEs or full-time equivalents. So that, that is captured. 
um, is, is my understanding. And actually, one of the experts behind that study is in the room with us, Ed Dahigan from the department, um, if there's further questions on it. Thank you. Um, so not to try to get you to uh, give a, uh, advocate for one policy over another, um, but putting on your economist hat, yeah. which um, I only have a uh, master's degree, not a PhD. Yes, you're a master's ahead of me. Um, what what uh, non-pricing solutions get the best bang for the buck? Weatherization, electrification. I th I think that it can be problematic to distinguish between pricing and non-pricing policies. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, with the um, resources for the future study that I believe presented uh, to you this week, the non-pricing policies they looked at were the ones that were recommended by the Vermont Climate Action Commission. And it's basically a series of incentive programs, rebate programs, that require additional revenue. I think 80% of them are incentive programs that require additional revenue to, to meet those emissions reduction targets. And if you don't implement carbon pricing or cap and invest of some measure, then the question becomes, where does that revenue come from? Um, so it's, it's theoretically <coughs> possible that you could just go with those, those non-pricing options in terms of incentives and rebates, but you would need an additional or new revenue source that's not carbon pricing. And the question then becomes, where does that come from? Um, Um, yeah, uh, and I should be asking this of them rather than you, but um, I, they, I believe that they talked in pricing options, um, they talked about a, in terms of driving behavior, a yeah. tax being more effective than mm -hmm. a gross receipts tax or an excise tax or something, something that's visible. Yeah, well, I t they were saying tax action instead of price. So if the, if the price goes up because the commodity price goes up, then that's one thing everybody kind of, kind of you know, right. adjusts to that. But if the tax goes up, people react. Well, and that's what they mean. Excise taxes causes the price to go up. You don't know why it's. Oh, it's behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do think that there is a common <laughs> misperception that is frankly based on the evidence, uh, intellectually dishonest, around describing carbon pricing or cap and invest as inherently regressive. Whether or not, um, and how it affects a price and which quintiles of income or portions of the population come out ahead or are held harmless or benefit depends entirely on how you design the, that policy and what you decide to do with the revenue. There's nothing inherently. Uh, you could design a carbon pricing policy that harms the economy or that harms low-income Vermonters, or you could design one. So it's all about those design questions of the policy of how does it get implemented and then what do you do with the, the, the revenue. It's, it's entirely possible to make sure that rural and low-income Vermonters come out ahead in a cap and invest or carbon pricing situation. It just comes down to the policy design. So I have a concern that um, that we are setting ourselves up for, uh, we collectively are setting ourselves up for dis disappointment in the marketplace when, we, when we're talking about how much less expensive electric vehicles are to operate. Um, you got to figure out there, or maybe it was something you mentioned about 60 cents a gallon uh, equivalent, or dollar fifty a gallon. Yeah. Um, and, um, the only conversion factor that I have for for um, miles to kWh is what I, we have Chevy Bolt. Yeah, we have about twenty five thousand miles on it. So GM tells us we're we're um, using about forty kilowatt hours per hundred mm -hmm. miles. So at, at at that rate, and this a Bolt is a small hatchback, kind of, you know, kind of box kind of car. If that car got forty miles a gallon with a gas motor, um, and Electricity costs 17 cents a kilowatt hour, and you know, multiplying all that through, mm -hmm. it comes out to around 270, 275 a gallon. Um, and at well, I, I just yeah. did a calculation for 60 cents, 60 cents uh, a gallon uh, equivalent, and multiplying all that out, yeah, it, electricity would have to cost 
three dollar or rather three and three quarter cents per kilowatt hour. So I'm just I just don't want to be promising, yeah. you know, over promising uh, right. savings. Yeah. The savings will, will come on the yeah. maintenance side, but I don't. It's not I, there on the operational yeah, side. Yeah, and I think it really depends how utilities design those charging rates in terms yeah, of that's true. encouraging off-peak usage, and that it becomes much less expensive to them charging overnight. That's a, that's a very important. Point. Whether or not a person has renewable energy generation on site when they're charging a car also makes a difference because yeah. if you're... It's the cost of electricity. What, what's the cost of electricity? So if, if the cost of electricity is less than 10 cents or something, uh, a kilowatt hour, then yeah, sure. Then it's a lot less expensive than a gallon of gas. Yeah. Anyway, it, it's, I, I'm just concerned about, yeah. about that. And there's because you know having worked in energy efficiency in the yes. 90s when uh, everybody said oh we're saving 20 25 30 percent of and then it, it when it didn't happen people get all like oh yeah. this, this is a waste of time and it and it certainly that was an average figure um that was uh, come to by drive electric vermont and, yeah. and they're the real experts in in that space right. but it's also an average figure and it varies by utility yeah. and different I'm just making, yeah. i'm just yes. i'm just making a comment <laughs> not asking for an answer i guess sorry <laughs> Any other questions for Jerry? Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, John. Trade you. Thanks. Welcome, John. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Tom Hughes. I represent Energy Independent Vermont, which is a coalition of organizations working to strengthen the Vermont economy, prioritize low income and rural Vermonters in a transition to clean energy and to reduce carbon pollution. Um, some of the members of the coalition include uh, Vermont Businesses for so Social Responsibility, Capstone Community Action, Joey Miller's Vermont Natural Resources Council, and many others. Um, what I'd like to do today, what I've been asked to, to come in, is my understanding, is to sort of bookend uh, the week. Um, earlier this week, you had an opportunity to, to hear from Resources for the Future and uh, their extensive analysis of carbon pricing and non-carbon pricing models uh, and what they would do for the Vermont economy. and. Uh, uh, I'd just like to put that in perspective from the advocacy community that's working on some climate uh, initiatives here in the state. So um, Future, a, a premier academic research firm located in Washington, D.C. to conduct the work. Uh, Resources for the Future, or RFF, um, has been studying the nexus between environmental and economic policy for seven decades now. They are uh, experts in this field. Um, the report itself provides uh, data and analysis on a number of different policies, including the Western Climate Initiative, which is the California and Quebec uh, uh, carbon pricing program, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is the program that Governor Scott is participating in, but is still in the design phase and very early in the design phase, um, which would cover uh, transportation fuels only. And then uh, the third policy which they dove into is uh, what's called the Economy Strengthening Strategic Energy Exchange, or Essex Plan, which was um, uh, a proposal developed by business leaders and low income advocates in 2017 and was a policy that was uh, in legislation last year but didn't move um, uh, beyond the, the drafting phase. RFF offers uh, data and analysis. They are not, they did not offer policy recommendations. Uh, at best, you could look at this report as a roadmap. It does a pretty good job of saying where we are and where we need to go, and then provides uh, a, a bunch of different options for how we might get there and describes those options, but doesn't make any recommendations. The report. You, one way to, to think about this report, and it's a, it's a hefty 170 plus pages, is um, to think about what the impacts of um, 
the any policy would be on <coughs> Vermont's economy, on equity for low income and rural Vermonters, and for the environment. Um, from the economic perspective, they looked at, again, these three carbon pricing models and found that the economic impacts would be very small, a 0 0.002 to 0 0.005 uh, range of uh, impacts on the Vermont economy. Just to put that in perspective, as, as Jared mentioned, we've got about a $32.2 billion GDP. 0.002% uh, is about $6 million of that, uh, of that total um, gross state product. Of the, of the uh, policies that they modeled, the, the Essex plan um, was the one that uh, modeled most favorably with a, with a small um, uh, net positive for the state economy. That's just on the economics side of things. When you factor in also the health benefits of reduced air pollutants that come with reduced carbon emissions, you can add in an additional seven to $19 million in healthcare benefits, uh, avoided healthcare costs, if <coughs> we were to pursue one of these three strategies. In terms of equity, one of the key findings from this report is that using carbon pricing revenues as, and then providing them, using the proceeds as rebates to Vermont households, again, as, as Jared described, designing the program to benefit uh, low income and rural Vermonters, a carbon pricing program can be highly progressive. Anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of Vermont households can come out ahead, and those households are the ones at the lowest two to three tiers of the economic ladder. Again, um, while the, the differences aren't large between a Western Climate Initiative or a Transportation Climate Initiative <coughs> or an Essex plan, the, the Essex plan did model out slightly more uh, progressive in terms of its uh, economic impacts than the other two. Uh, the third dimension which this study looks at and which I encourage you to think about uh, climate policy is on the environment and on the, on the climate. Um, and one of the stark things that we just have to remind ourselves every day is that we're not anywhere close to hitting our goals um, and that without new policies, we're not going to hit them. Those goals that uh, the last three governors have established and that the, the legislature uh, put into statute. What the, the researchers showed was that carbon pricing can play an integral role in a, uh, in a broad suite of policies to reduce carbon emissions. Um, but there's no <coughs> carbon pricing program on the table in Vermont or under consideration that could do it all. Now, the, the, the price you would have to ap apply is uh, politically untenable um, in, in the state. Again, however, um, uh, the Essex plan um, would reduce carbon emissions slightly more than the other two policies that are, are under consideration. On the roadmap analogy, one of the hopeful things that this report does lay out is that we can get there from here. It's just going to take more than carbon pricing to do it. We're going to have to put carbon pricing together with a suite of other non-pricing uh, initiatives in order to meet Vermont's climate emissions goals. Um, what the report doesn't do, however, it, is it doesn't delve into what the economic and equity dimensions of those other policies would be. What, what does providing a $5,000 rebate or incentive for an electric vehicle, whether it's uh, 100 <coughs> electric vehicles or 1,000 or the 50,000 that the governor was mentioning in yesterday's uh, budget address. Where does that money come from, and, and how do we um, uh, how do we get it to, in order to devote it to, to climate action? Last slide here. The top takeaways from this study: um, 
with the policy in place with the policies we currently have in place Vermont's not going to get to our climate and clean energy goals uh, new policies are needed and necessary the Trump administration isn't going to help us and um, that means that we are on our own as states either individually or working in partnership with other other states um, however there is a way to get from point a to point b and um, carbon pricing in c combination with some of the other um, ideas that the vermont climate action commission has proposed <coughs> and others could help us um, get get there the challenge to you all as this committee and the legislature and lawmakers uh, in general is to reach that goal while also strengthening <coughs> the economy and making sure that low income and rural Vermonters aren't left behind. Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, Tom, um, as you said, the uh, RFF report says that carbon pricing alone won't get us there. Carbon pricing plus uh, non pricing uh, incentives, penalties uh, will help us achieve those goals. But with the Essex plan, or any other plan that offers rebates um, to Vermonters, if you give the money back in some form, then how do you achieve the non-pricing goals? So it means that you're gonna have to have a source of revenue in addition or take money from, some, from someplace else in order to implement the non-pricing uh, um, policies. That's true, and in that sense, Carbon pricing is the low-hanging fruit of the next, it's the next step that we can take. Mm -hmm. Because all of the other proposals mm -hmm. on the table are gonna require additional revenues. Carbon pricing is the revenue. The, quest the, the question is, what do you do with those revenues to uh, achieve the three goals that we think you should be working towards, environment, equity, and economy? So with a cap and trade system or some other type of program like that, um, you could uh, use the revenues from the penalties in order to do the non-pricing things. But then you don't really, it, then, you, then you have the question of equity in terms of uh, income levels. That's right. If you if you design a cap and trade program and you used all the money for rebates for electric vehicles, only those who take advantages of those incentives for electric vehicles come out ahead, whereas <coughs> everybody who's paying the higher price um, uh, might have a, a a negative economic Im impact. There's it. I don't envy your position <laughs> here, but there is um, uh, the the report does lay out pretty um, clearly that there is a economic advantage, there's uh, an uh, environmental advantage, and there is a way to do uh, climate carbon reductions equitably through a carbon pricing program, whether it's WCI, TCI, or the Essex plan. Well, this probably is uh, it's more of a question for the uh, folks at RFF than you, but if you, I'm not sure whether their analysis that, um, looked at using part of the revenues from a carbon price or a cap and trade system for non-pricing incentives and what that would do to their numbers in terms of what quintiles benefit and which don't. Yeah, the, um, uh, they did not. Uh, they discussed a little bit. I don't know if it was in, in your joint committee hearing or at a, at a different hearing at some point later in the week. But they made clear one that they just looked at 100% uh, rebates or uh, return. Um, but policies don't have to be 100% one way or 100% of the other way. You could certainly design a, a policy that was a mix between uh, rebates and using the revenues for investments in clean energy. So um, the, 
the Scott administration has um, kind of put their toe in the water on transportation climate initiative and exploring that. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see where, where that heads. Um, and, and potentially that could make a meaningful move toward um, meeting the, the, the Paris commitments um, that we've made as a state. Um, we actually have uh, a witness coming in, uh, Peter Wolf <coughs> from PNR, coming in next week to talk about some of the um, things that maybe the administration's thinking about or some of the climate study uh, work that was done, I guess, completed about a year ago. Um, are there things, I'll just, since you're sitting in the witness chair, I'll ask you, are there things that um, you would highlight um, in addition to you know, some of the things you've noted on carbon pricing, are there, there's things that you would highlight that came out of that report that um, you would prioritize, or um, Jared, you, you feel free to chime in as well, um, that you would prioritize as places we should look. Um, RFF, you know, was talking about pricing and non-pricing solutions. Um, they would work better together. Mm -hmm. But are there, there really weren't pricing solutions in that report. Um, but are there things there that you would highlight as an advocate for getting our greenhouse gas emissions down, for being more energy independent as the things that we should first look to? Sure. Well, um, uh, just to be clear, you're talking about the Vermont Climate Action Commission yes. report from yeah. about yes. a year ago. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, one of the... Um, uh, the recommendations, which I, I wish we had been in there, but I think that uh, probably if they had an opportunity to sit down again would be in there, yeah. um, uh, is a 100% renewable energy standard. Currently we have a, uh, a renewable energy standard, but we're driving towards 90% um, renewable instead of driving towards 100% renewable. Um, and if we could put a, um, that 100% renewable into <coughs> statute make that the 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 goal post you know the end zone rather than just getting 90 percent of the way there mm -hmm. that's um uh, a no cost way of um uh making progress you know oh, it's no cost because you have, to, you have to change the you know the slope fair, of the curve fair, fair enough um the um uh, and another uh, option is to make the whatever goals they are, whether they're the current RES goals or um, the more ambitious 100% goals, mandatory rather than just nice goals that are statutory, but they're just goals. They're not requirements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jared, you want to chime in? Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, a better strategy um, might not be to uh, prioritize non-pricing strategies uh, first, um, probably with uh, using using uh, money revenue raised by uh, some sort of a uh, fee on, on on fossil fuels, but with the goal of being not. To uh, not to use carbon pricing to, 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 re to reduce energy usage and greenhouse gas, but but uh, to to use that revenue to uh, to stimulate really more comprehensive uh, non-pricing strategies like increasing weatherization, making weatherization available to people uh, above the current um, income threshold, maybe on a sliding scale. Um, some other I ideas that I've been thinking about. Um, um, hiring people to enforce the energy codes that we have, which are completely unenforced now, um, and you, and using that group of people to also basically coach and train uh, contractors about the energy code and how to and how to and how to uh, uh, build better, um, and maybe also to incentivize contractors to um, to have uh, get building performance training themselves, things like that. That might have an impact on at least building energy. I mean, there's other things to be done about about transportation, but um, I'm just wondering if that might not be a better strategy um, to look at this as more of a of a workforce problem, an economy problem, a, a cost savings problem, rather than a rather than a this nebulous um, to, to a lot of people, and some people even don't think that it's a problem. Uh, climate crisis. Well, that's why I encourage you to think about it um, under those three dimensions of the economy, equity, and the environment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what you're 
describing is essentially a, a fee and invests model. I mean, if mm -hmm. all all of the additional building inspectors, weatherization work uh, that you described, they're all necessary to meet the the goals that um, that Jared laid out uh, expertly uh, on the charts. Fund that through a some sort of price on fossil fuels, whether it be a fee or tax, uh, um, uh, you know, what, what a fine, what have you, the, it is a, a, outside of this building, it is a distinction without a difference for, for most Vermonters. Mm -hmm. um, and but it would have to be much less than a, than a, than a carbon tax a, to, raise, to raise a significant amount of money, from what I'm understanding, but maybe I, I'm just learning all this, so I'm, I'm just throwing out the idea mm -hmm. and, and for discussion, that's all. So, do we have any info on what the economic impact of doing nothing at all is? It, we it may yeah. have been mentioned earlier in the week, but we absorbed do a lot of nothing. What's the economic impact of doing nothing? <laughs> well, um, uh, to put that, um, put a number on it, is, Again, Jared mentioned that we spend uh, about one and a half billion dollars a year on imported fossil fuels. That's all money that leaves our right. economy. Um, the, uh, uh, however, if we were generating that same energy through renewable sources that were located uh -huh. more closer to home, those energy dollars would circulate in the local and regional economy rather than being shipped out of out of state right i don't have a uh, uh a particular study that i can point to on that but the um uh at that at the household level again if we can move people to lower cost renewables um, instead of the higher cost fossil fuels those households are going to save money <coughs> as, as jared's charts were showing right and a dollar spent in the in the state gets recirculated and creates more than a dollar worth of economic activity. So the, I guess I'm looking for the delta between not just that 1.5 billion, but between that 1.5 billion times whatever additional GDP would be applied to the state or whatever. Jared, do you have a, uh, a report that you're, you're nodding your head like you have a report? I'm nodding my head because it's a great and important question. I don't think it's been fully answered okay. yet. Um, I, I think you could fairly say if we do nothing, we'll continue to see 80% of our energy dollars used on fossil fuels, and then 80 cents of all of those dollars leaving the state. So we'll continue having this net economic drain that's hampering our economic growth and investing in local jobs. I don't know if it, we haven't, it hasn't yet been fully calculated what the net economic benefit would be, um, yeah. Okay. So, okay, go ahead. No, I've just got a point to make on, on Scott's proposal as far as uh, just single family residential construction goes. Uh, as a contractor myself, uh, over the years, I can't think of uh, a house that I've built that the individuals don't buy their own materials. And a lot of them, uh, I think I've built two houses basically that have been built through Craigslist materials. So again, I think it would be a huge uh, increase in cost. I understand the benefits on the you know energy side of things if you if you built a certain code, but uh, uh, the costs out there are extreme as it is, and to have that level in that you know residential category alone would, would be devastating to a lot of folks. So it, just in the context of committee discussion, I don't mean to ascribe this to your testimony, Tom, but. Um, you know, one of the ways I think about your, your question, Seth, of, um, you know, what would the, what's the cost of doing nothing? Because um, that's, that's always the easiest path, is to do nothing. Um, a, a question, a concern that I have is, you know, if we look out 20 years, uh, some would say less, some would say more, that when our economy and our climate is at a point where we are truly in a daily crisis. Um, a concern that I have is that a number of states, a number of countries at that point will genuflect to a solution, which will be very costly. 
In other words, they're going to have to compress the amount of change that's got to occur in the economy into a very small amount of time. Whether it's, you know, uh, immediately turning off the spigot for using certain types of fuels or in a very compressed amount of time requiring certain changes to occur. And um, I think it's, from an economic standpoint, uh, those transitions are better made over longer periods of time. So the extent that we can, uh, you know, one could say we should have been focusing on these things 20 years ago and had a much longer ramp to these solutions, which would have been much less disruptive. But you know, the, the, the context in that we give ourselves longer time to make okay. these changes, I think is less economically disruptive. And um, so, you know, starting to look at those things with immediacy, um, will ultimately, I think, be less economically disruptive than when, you know, we wake up in 2030 and say, we got to turn this off. That, I think, is really economically cost costly. Now, that's speculative on my part, but that's one of the ways I think about this. And just piggybacking on that, <coughs> uh, those solutions are going to have, we're, we're turning those solutions over to our children and grandchildren. <laughs> I don't like my kids very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, there you go. It's easy then. You know, <laughs> well, you can also say it's putting on a credit card to future generations. I kind of equate it to studying for a test. You, you know the test is coming. Um, you either start studying uh, you know, a month ahead of time, a week ahead of time, the night before, or you wake up that morning and say, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that's a cut for one right now. Any other questions for Tom? Uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, so th that's all the committee work we're going to do today. Um,